Good morning, Professor Rosid. Hey. 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 I live in the island, or is he? I live in the island, sir. He was the only girl. Thank you, leave Gorilla, the Teddy's name. Any answer? Susan, uh, you Video setting check on a mill set Setting my way, so video setting my say minor my video console mirror. Okay, so always display on as I know. Visible, why not the key? Meeting Manale.
pues. Susan. In fact, mero aapko camera on bahar se dewara. Hello, namaskar, namaskar. Good morning. Namaste. Professor Rashid. Yes. May I see you now? Yes, of course, you can see me. <laughs> Good morning from Kathmandu. Good morning from Dhaka. Uh, how is the weather there? So should be a little hot. It's very hot. It's very hot and humid uh, <laughs> because the monsoon has just started. Yeah. So, um, in fact, today is a bit cloudy and also very uh, humid and damp. Uh, is it raining uh, there or? It I rained think a lot. Yesterday it rained a lot. Not today, uh, but it is cloudy today, so rain may come at any time. And, uh, could you please uh, share your slide from your your side? Yeah, if you, yes. if you send me, uh, I could ask my uh, friend to to share from here. Okay. Uh, uh, what I will do is the plan is that um, I, I'll try to share it, uh, um, um, coordinate from my side. So once the class starts, um, I will use uh, this particular platform that is Zoom uh, to show the slides. But at the same time, I am emailing the slides to you just in case. Okay. Thank you very okay. much. Okay. So just give me one minute. We'll, uh, uh, begin. We will begin shortly. Okay. Sakti talks off. Good morning from Kathmandu. We have a friend from um, uh, United States. He might be waiting us for the midnight here. Still around 10 or 10.30. Badi badi sir, parvasma. Nine fifteen. Namaskar. Namaste. Namaste. Love. America, mom, Bashipani, Gurkhali like the samjhi rahnu pare ho na samjha ho. Thank you very much for coming. <laughs> Thank you very much, sir. Originally Gurkhali pare the var. So we are now twenty nine and. Uh, uh, in next couple of minutes, Samro. Professor Rashid. Uh, so we will have uh, some 40 plus minute uh, deliberation by Professor Rashid Zaman. And uh, I will uh, open the floors uh, to make questions for, for Professor Rashid. On Khagana sir, Namaste. Namaskar sir. Uh, actually, uh, Professor Rashid, uh, I will introduce him. I will read out his bio later on. So uh, I just like, like to share the modality. Uh, initially, I will uh, introduce Professor Rashid Ujaman and uh, you will speak some 30 to 40 minutes and we'll have a round of uh, interaction, especially uh, not much uh, political, uh, however, more theoretical. And in the meantime, I encourage you, uh, his areas of interest is uh, especially IR theories and, and small state and uh, UN peacekeeping and security uh, strategy and these are his areas of expertise so that we are in the South Asia. So your questions uh, would be uh, would be somewhere from around uh, India, Bangladesh, small state and foreign policy, national security challenges, and how SARC and, and which was uh, conceived by uh, leaders from Bangladesh, Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, and also we uh, King Birendra back in Nepal, and why SAR could not work. So uh, then uh, these are these are the areas unlike. Uh, so Professor Rashid, so may I uh, start to in, introduce uh, you now and then proceed. Good morning, ahead. sir. Good morning, good morning. So we have almost uh, 35 uh, participation on board. So they will keep coming. So uh, good morning, namaste, salam, walikum from Kathmandu and everyone else. And 
Professor Rashid Zaman, this morning uh, he uh, is uh, with us delivering a lecture on small state and foreign policy. And it's my great pleasure to introduce Professor Rashid Zaman, uh, to whom I know for the last eight, nine years. Uh, professor Rashid Zaman is a very young uh, professor at Dhaka University. And he uh, did his bachelor uh, from Dhaka University. As I, some of my students, I share with you that Dhaka University is a, was known as a Oxford of South Asia during colonial era, even Asia. It was a very old university, 100 years old, uh, 2021. Uh, Dhaka is going to celebrate 100 years uh, anniversary. So even in international relations study, Dhaka is a pioneer in South Asia. And where uh, Professor Rashidu Zaman uh, did his undergrad, so we went to United Kingdom for his master's at the Hall University, and he did his PhD from University of Reading, UK, and he also did a postdoctoral fellowship under a Fulbright Scholarship in the United States. And he has done so many research uh, and fellowship in in uh, United States and United Kingdom, and even in uh, uh, other Western Europe European countries. So uh, his major areas of research is uh, foreign policy theories and especially on uh, UN peacekeeping. As you know that uh, Bangladesh is also one of the top uh, three, four uh, peace contributor in the US peacekeeping like us. And uh, the research on uh, UN peacekeeping is, is uh, and books, a publication by Rotley's Oxford uh, on those areas, uh, so far already and in his credit uh, of uh, Professor Rashid Zaman. So he was, uh, he has just like accomplished uh, a responsibility of the head of the Department of uh, International Relations at Dhaka University. And he's also associated with the Bangladesh uh, National Defense uh, University and Bangladesh other uh, public university where uh, international relations and security areas are being taught. So uh, having, uh, it's our great pleasure to have a very young department like International Lesson in Nepal. We are very infant stage, just five, six years. So uh, to have, um, I was looking for uh, brotherhood, uh, none other than big power, especially the small power should be in board. So to learn how small power uh, uh, schooling is, is being coming, uh, come is, has been coming up like, uh, in academia. So uh, from uh, the Bangladesh and Dhaka University, uh, from which uh, we could learn uh, a lot in academia. So Professor Rashid Zaman, he accepted uh, my request uh, even before to be, uh, to be as, a, uh, as an uh, guide, co-guide of university a PhD dissertation or external examiners of our PhD so that uh, we could learn uh, to enhance our academic uh, academic program back in home. So thank you very much, Professor Rashid Zaman, this morning with us. And we have uh, some former diplomats. We have some friends from the United States, uh, those who are teaching at the university. Uh, they are, of course, originally from Nepal, studying in Nepal. So uh, we have a uh, faculty and we have a master's and PhD student. Some of our friends who are none other than international relations discipline of professors from English, professor from rural development and all the social sciences are, are with us this morning. So uh, you are most welcome, Professor Rashid uh, from Kathmandu. And uh, I would like to request you to uh, proceed ahead. And the modality will be, we'll speak uh, uh, some 40 minutes around or up to an hour. And then I'll open the floor and there will be a three question in a round. And then uh, how, how many students who are, are participant will be will be interested to uh, raise the questions, uh, share uh, their observation, and then I will um, request you to uh, to respond them. So this this uh, at the end. So I will ask uh, our uh, senior faculty uh, ambassador Kalanath Adhikari sir to express mm -hmm. board of thanks uh, for to to Professor Rashid Zaman. So this will be the modality of our uh, this morning lectures. Okay, over to you, Professor Rashid, please. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Sadda. And a very good morning to all of you from Dhaka. Um, as Professor Sadda has already uh, mentioned, 
um, that we go way back. Um, it has been quite a few years since um, uh, I have been in touch with Professor Khadra. And of course, um, I think last time we met, uh, it was at Shanghai. Uh, so when he uh, emailed me a couple of uh, days back saying that um, he would like to, uh, he would like me to, to speak uh, to, at um, Tuvokan University. Uh, I was elated. Of course, I accepted um, gladly. Um, so what we will do today, as Professor Khatka has already pointed out, um, <clears throat> uh, I'll speak for about an hour. Uh, you must remember one very important thing that um, Bengalis by nature, they tend to talk a lot. And on top of that, I am a teacher. So which means that um, there is a double jeopardy over here, one Bengali, one teacher. Uh, so that means that um, most of them will be speaking on and on and on. Uh, but I'll try to make it interesting. I'll try to, um, as I say, I mean, uh, the objective is to talk about small states, uh, to talk about foreign policy. Uh, there is this idea that small states usually are powerless whenever it comes to international relations. I will try to look at it from a different angle. Uh, so try to use a bit of IR theory Look at Bangladesh particularly. Um, Please uh, turn off your microphone when the uh, professor is speaking. Everyone yes. are requested to turn off your microphone, please. So uh, uh, what I'll do is uh, uh, I'll speak a bit about uh, how small states go about using power in international relations. Uh, so there is a theoretical component over there. And also we look, we, I'll be looking at Bangladesh's foreign policy, particularly um, uh, given the fact that we are now witnessing, um, um, I won't say tension, but rather competition between uh, two powerful states within uh, South Asia and also beyond South Asia. And of course, the implication of that um, is obvious for all of us. So how Bangladesh is coping with it um, under such circumstances? Uh, what, are, what are the things which have happened over the past few years um, over here in Bangladesh? These are the things which I hope to discuss. <clears throat> I've already sent my PowerPoint presentation to Professor Khatka. Uh, so he will be sharing that with you um, after the end of the class. In the meantime, what I'll try to do is, I'm not an expert um, with regard to the using of Zoom, but still I'll try to uh, show the slides and I will uh, speak for about an hour. And after that, um, of course, uh, I'll be happy to take questions and answers. I hope that is okay with all of you. Um, sure, professor, you can share the screen. Yes, I'll share the screen. Uh, another thing is that uh, I, I tend to speak quite fast. Um, uh, so, uh, but today I'll try to speak slowly, but still, uh, please um, forgive me if at times I, I uh, just go too fast. Uh, just send me a message over the chat and I, I'll try to slow down. Um, or, or you can always ask Professor Khadra to, to inform me and I'm sure that he will keep me um, uh, uh, within the, uh, the uh, Necessary speed. So, with your permission, Professor Khatka, I'd like to start the presentation. So, let me see. So, can everyone see this? Sir, uh, yes, this scene. Okay. okay, okay. So, let us start. Um, I start off by looking at. Uh, <clears throat> I start off by looking at uh, what we mean by why do we need to talk about um, a small states. Okay, so I say uh, this is my first argument that whenever we talk about foreign policy, it is very very important that there has to be certain tools to analyze the factors that shape and condition the external behavior of the unit under study. So if you're looking at Nepal, for example, if you're looking at Bangladesh, for example, or Maldives, or any other country, Singapore, for example, Qatar, Cuba, for that matter, Djibouti, my favorite example, I'll talk a bit about Djibouti today. So whenever we talk about this, a lot of data accordingly come up, a lot of information accordingly come up. And of course, we are being asked to uh, identify, we are being asked to, uh, to analyze the factors that shape and condition the external behavior of Djibouti, Bangladesh, Nepal, or Cuba. And uh, of course, uh, since there is a lot of information, so we need, what we need to do is we need to approach the problem in such a manner. That is, number one, we need to order, systematically study, and relate the information together. So there has to be order, in other words. A lot of information, and particularly in today's world, when you are click away from information, there is too much information. In fact, uh, George Orwell pointed out long ago that there is this problem that in today's world, and, and he was speaking, remember, in the 1940s, and, and today it is 2020, and of course, um, the world is now deluged with information. 
the, the, the Orwell pointed out long ago, George Orwell, that um, why is it that when we have so much information that people are not able to uh, uh, know much, they're not able to make good decisions. So this is an Orwellian paradox. And in today's world, particularly with regard to international relations, this Orwellian paradox, of course, applies. So that is why we argue that, okay, whenever we have this information, whenever we know so many things, that is fine, but we need to put order there. So there has to be a systematic study. And of course, we have to make connections between everything, number one. And of course, number two, we have to explain the behavior in a meaningful way. So once we have this information, we look at this particular country and we try to say, or uh, this unit, and we try to say that, okay, why is it acting in this particular manner? Of course, please remember one very important thing. It doesn't mean that you can accurately predict how this country is going to uh, proceed in the days ahead, how this, this country is going to act in, in a, each and every uh, situation. Uh, often that is not possible because as most of you, in fact, most of you have studied international relations, you know that one of the biggest challenges that the human factor is always there and nothing is more complex than the human mind. So you may come up with a lot of theories uh, you may come up with a lot of models, but at the end of the day, uh, the human mind is often unfathomable. Fa fathomable. And of course, as as, um, as uh, uh, lead, uh, particularly famous writers often uh, do not forget to point out, uh, out to us that uh, the mind has reasons which reason does not know. Uh, I'm talking about the French um, uh, uh, scholar Pascal, when he pointed out that uh, this is the problem with the human mind, that you can measure uh, the distance from the earth to the moon, you can look inside the oceans, you can uh, identify everything, you can uh, theorize everything, you can measure everything, but the human mind is often uh, unfathomable. So this is the problem. But still, we need to proceed. We need to make some sense of the world which is out there, particularly in the world of international issues. So we think that it is very, very important that we put order over there, relate the information and try to explain the behavior in a meaningful way. So what we do to, to counter the problem of too much information is that students of foreign policy find it profitable to classify units under studies so as to develop order and to establish significant variables, what I have already discussed. So the same also applies for this particular lecture. So today, what I'll try to do is I'll try to use the idea of small state concept to explain foreign policy behavior data. Uh, so uh, if foreign policy research is to find out why and how a state behave as it, as it does, why is Bangladesh acting in this particular way? Why is India and China acting right now in a particular way? Why is United States acting like this in a particular way, or Russia for that matter, um, or Nepal, um, or Sri Lanka, for example, or, or Pakistan for that matter. So what we try to do is we try to find out why and how a state behaves as it does to arrive at generalizations. And now I know that generalizations are very dangerous. Uh, you cannot paint everything with one brush, particularly when we're talking about international relations. So Nepal's reality, Bangladesh's reality, Myanmar's reality, India's reality, definitely there will be differences, but still there must be some broad understanding and that is what I'll try to do. So please, uh, a caveat as I, as I proceed with the lecture is that this doesn't mean that I can answer all your questions. This doesn't mean that it will always, the model which I'm sharing with you today will answer all problem, all, all the questions which you have about Bangladesh, but still the idea is to give you a general idea. And of course, to provide data for further studies to read uh, uh, to lead to regularities and recurrent patterns so that we can understand what is out there. Please remember one very important thing that theory is not is not a silver bullet. Theory does not provide answer to everything. What theory does is that it provides you like a sort of a a hanger on which you can hang your coat. So every time you go out there, uh, when you look at the world, you try to look at the world by using the window called the theory and try to make sense of the whole world which is out there. Of course, it doesn't mean that you can see everything. It doesn't mean that um, you are getting a true picture of what is out there, but still there is some sort of semblance, some sort of order, and that is what theory is all about. So the same also applies for IR theories also. So be careful. Uh, all theory, no theories answer, uh, no theory answer, will provide answer to all your question, but still it will help make sense of the world which is out there. And that is why we use theory. 
So let us look at the big issue, and that is the issue of small states. What do we mean by small states? And of course, as Professor Khadka pointed out when he, uh, when he approached me, or when he invited me to give this lecture, is that uh, particularly given that the fact that we are living in South Asia, where there is a huge power asymmetry. Um, uh, uh, so you have countries like Nepal, Bhutan, Bangladesh, um, uh, Sri Lanka, Maldives, and even Pakistan for that matter. And of course, you have one country in the middle, which is India. And, and the power asymmetry is, is there obvious. I mean, if you look at the map, if you look at um, the numbers, this is something which often be this becomes very clear. But, and of course, that also leads to this, this problem of um, saying that, uh, okay, South Asian countries are small. Most of these South Asian countries are small. And therefore, um, they're always in a dilemma. They're always in a difficult situation whenever we talk about international relations. And this idea particularly comes from what is called the realist school of international relations. So that is why I have said that uh, uh, whenever we talk about small states, please remember that the conventional wisdom on small states is that uh, uh, even though small, not all small states are powerless when they're confronted directly uh, by a great power, the logic of Thucydides still holds. Now, when I talk about the logic of Thucydides, my, my friends, please remember I'm talking about the Malian dialogue. I'm sure you are familiar with the Melian Dialogue, M-E-L-I-A-N, Melian Dialogue. Uh, the Melian Dialogue um, says that a small country, small entities, so you know the story. The story is that the Athenians and the Spartans, they're fighting. And of course, the Athenians ultimately decide that they're going to take over this island called Milos. But Milos is a neutral uh, entity. So when the Athenian fleet reaches Milos, the people of Milos tells the Athenian general that, look, why have you come to Milos? We are neutral in your conflict with Sparta. We support neither of uh, neither of you. And of course, we want to live our own life. So this is not our quarrel. This is not our conflict. So please leave us alone. And then, of course, the Athenians tell the uh, Milians that, no, you have to join us. Uh, if you don't join us, then of course we will identify you as the enemy. When the millions refused to accept this, the millions came up with the logic. And the logic is that, of course, the logic which all, most of the time we use, and that is that, look, I'm a neutral. I do not want to get involved in, in your conflict. I do not have any ambition. And of course, I'm not doing any harm to you. That is the most important thing. But the Athenians ultimately uh, told the millions that, look, the reality is that in today's world, uh, you cannot be neutral. And of course, we will do whatever we like. That is, we will take over Milos. And of course, uh, uh, you cannot do anything about it. The millions ultimately use the logic of uh, 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 right, uh, use the logic of uh, of uh, uh, justice, it say that uh, okay, what you are doing to us is injustice. What you are doing to us uh, should not be done to any country. And that is when the famous uh, quotation came from the Athenian general that the strong do whatever they like, and the weak they have to accept it. This is the logic of uh, Thucydides, and of course, it also applies to international relations in a big way. In fact, this is the uh, you can say the. Uh, the foundation on which uh, modern international relations is built up. That is, um, uh, the Melian dialogue is often taught to the students at the very beginning of the class, and they're told that this is what international relations is all about, that the strong will do what they like, and the weak, they have to accept it. And of course, whenever we say that the strong will do what they like, and the weak have to accept it, this logic is underpinned by a military-oriented, resource-based conception of compulsory power. Athens is a strong, powerful country. It has a tremendously powerful navy. It has a big army. It has all the wealth. In fact, it is the richest city uh, in, Athens, in, in Greece. And of course, here is tiny Milos. And of course, the Athenians are going there and telling them that we want to take over this piece of land. The millions tell them why we have not done any harm to you. But of course, the Athenians say that we don't care. We are a powerful country and we will do whatever we like compulsory power. We have the power to take away Milos from you. And eventually that was done. Milos was taken over. All the men were killed. Uh, the women and children, they were all sold to slavery. And Milos ultimately became a part and parcel of, of Athens. So this is how traditionally we tend to think about international relations. But of course, this approach to power is deeply embedded in the study of small states and indeed in many of the, in, in the many and contested definition of small state. So, 
uh, in other words, when today, uh, nearly 2,500 years later after the Peloponnesian War, when today we look at international relations, the logic of society still applies. So whenever we talk about small states, we usually tend to think that small states are reactive powers. They're simply trying to survive in today's world. Um, and of course, the big, they often exist at the mercy of the powerful states. So if the powerful states wish, they can do whatever they like to us. But the fact that they're not doing it doesn't mean that we are powerful. It simply is um, somewhat that they are not concerned about us right now. Or they're willing to let us go as, we, as uh, the situation stands. And, and somewhat we are at their mercy. However, IR scholars have long recognized that brute quantification of resources are inadequate metric for many issues in world politics. So in other words, I'm now putting up a counter logic and the counter logic is that yes, realism will always tell us, realism will tell us that military might really matters, compulsory power, um, uh, that is what really counts in international relations. So when you ever you have a big country, a powerful economy, a powerful military, that country, usually uh, the idea is the rule of the thumb is that that country will usually be very successful in international relations. But if you look around you, you will notice that often this is not the case. So whether you look at the war in Vietnam, uh, that is the first and second Indochina war, whether you look at what the Soviets experienced in Afghanistan, um, in fact, if you look at the present day world, if you look at what has happened in Iraq and what has happened in Afghanistan, you have the world's most powerful country. And this powerful country has been fighting a war where trillions of dollars have been used. Uh, it has all the uh, most advanced weapons in the world. It has a very, very powerful military. Uh, very few people, very few country can stand in front of this military. I'm talking about United States. Uh, but in spite of that, since 2001, uh, United States has been waging a war in Afghanistan. And today, uh, nearly 19 years later, after trillions of dollars have been wasted and hundreds of thousands of people have been killed, ton, mil, hundreds and thousands of tons of bombs have been dropped, uh, United States has not been able to find out uh, or to to uh, uh, to bring about that elusive victory in in Afghanistan. So that immediately makes you wonder: that is international relations always about military? Is it always a fact of international relations that the strong countries will automatically be successful in international relations? In fact, if you look at even at the history of the 20th century, you will notice that that is often not the case. So that is why. We often say that even in military field, great powers may topple governments as if they're, will, if they're willing to take a major effort, but then find victory elusive. United States in Afghanistan, United States in Iraq, uh, United States in Vietnam, United States, Soviet Union in Afghanistan. And even if you look at a country like Israel, for example, uh, um, outstanding military uh, force, uh, tremendous economic power compared to the Arab countries, very, very powerful, even though it is uh, geographically very small. But still, Israel has not been able to translate the victories of 1967 or even 1973, for that matter, uh, into a durable peace, because that is what it is all about. Remember, we fight wars for the peace which follows. But if you win in the battlefield, but then again, peace ultimately eludes you, then of course there's a big question mark over the efficacy of your military. So the same also applies for small states. We tend to think that small states are weak. We tend to think that small states do not really matter in international relations, but history tells us that that is not really the case. So several years ago, and of course I will be happy to share uh, whatever literature I have with small states. You have my email address. You can also take it from Professor Khadga. Uh, you can email me directly and I'll be happy to share uh, whatever resources, books, particularly journals, which I have on small states, uh, I'll be happy to share them with you. So one such literature tells us that small states are often treated as objects, not as subjects of international relations. In fact, the work on small states has alternated between emphasizing constraints and limitations on the one hand, that is, Small states are constrained, small states really do not have power, um, and hence they're powerless. And on the other hand of the spectrum, so if you are looking at a scale, on one hand, uh, at once, on one side, you have all the constraints and limitations. On the other hand, you have independence, resilience, and even power. So there are some who will come and tell you that no, small states are not as uh, powerless as you assume them to be. So they, 
they are powerful in their own way and we will be talking about that today so in the post cold war ir scholarship the focus on small states possibilities have grown more prevalent the emphasis does not only reflect uh, more auspicious international conditions so today we are living in a world where there are uh, where you have the united nations you have a rule and norm based international system where usually aggression is found upon uh, i emphasize on the word usually it all, there may be exceptions but usually aggression is frowned upon decolonization has taken place okay uh, it is not easily possible for a powerful country to go and take over another country so that is why i say that there is this auspicious international condition so that is there uh, there are divergent perceptions of small states implicitly reflect different conceptualizations of what it means to exercise power in international relations in other words there is a there are different interpretations of the power of small states so there are two big things ladies and gentlemen number one you have a reality where the global system has undergone changes yes there are a lot of uh, problems with the international system but still uh, it is often much more better than what we had uh, even prior to 19 uh, that is the second world war uh, before 1945 and on top of that the study of international relations tells us that uh, the way we we assume small states to be the way you have this stereotypical image of small states that often does not apply so in other words small states are not as weak as you uh, make out them to be so let us see how uh, how this thing works out the first thing which we need to clarify is the term small state and this literature uh, uh, the literature lacks a common definition or set of criteria to define uh, which state counts as small and and i'll give you one example so that you understand this if you look at bangladesh um, and uh, from the very beginning of today's lecture i have been talking about small states so i talked about nepal i talked about bangladesh i talked about sri lanka i talked about maldives bhutan i lumped them all together but if you look at a country called bangladesh just to give you one example and there, there are many examples out there like this uh how can you call bangladesh a small state when it this is the eighth largest country in the world in terms of population okay so if you look at population that is about 170 million people um in the last uh, census it was about uh, 160 million uh, but of course that took place about uh, seven eight years ago and since then the population uh, definitely has increased so if i assume that we have about 170 million people often many countries in the world compared to us will of course look smaller so even if i look at a country like russia for example if i put it beside bangladesh yes russia is a huge country um, it is a superpower or we assumed at one point of time it was superpower and then it has fallen but still it is trying to make a comeback today it is a resource rich country it has nuclear weapons it is a powerful military uh, and of course the physical size of uh, the uh, uh, Russia is simply, for many of us, uh, it is often inconceivable for us to imagine. Russia has 12 time zones, ladies and gentlemen, okay? Whereas in Bangladesh, we have one time zone and that is more than enough for us. Uh, so here you have a small country compared to Russia, but then if you look at in terms of population, uh, often, uh, I, I'm not sure what the exact population of, right, uh, of Russia right now, but I think either it is less than that of bangladesh or more or less bangladesh is, is close to that of russia so can i say that compared uh, if i take the population criteria into consideration bangladesh is a small state certainly not bangladesh's economy is growing for example you have millions of bangladeshis out in the world the diaspora they're sending in money um, uh, they are uh, uh, putting in a lot of effort I mean, brains and muscle to ultimately take the country forward and of course wherever they are they're also uh, playing a very important role in those countries also so if you take all these criteria into consideration whether you can identify a country as a small state that question automatically comes up and of course when you have this whole plethora of states diverse such as honduras lesotho uh, singapore switzerland qatar bangladesh nepal can you put all of them in one theoretical category that is something which you need to ask yourself so this is the big problem ladies and gentlemen the problem is that when we talk about small states we tend to assume that they share some certain uh, the common criteria but often that is not the case and i'll give you one example notice that in my slide i have asked that whether turkey and spain are also seen as small states now many of you are wondering that okay what is he thinking why is Tur why, how can turkey how can spain be small states 
the reason why i i pointing out this to you is that when professor khanka asked me to talk about small states and i started looking at all the books which i have on small states it was very interesting that i found a book uh, this was published in about uh, the 1960s and in this particular book it's a it's a great book i'll be happy to share that with you uh, uh, the author is looking at turkey and he's looking at turkey as a small state and he's saying that turkey's foreign policy decisions in the in the during the second world war this is a classic example of a, how a small state can do its foreign policy in in a time of a war and i was like thinking what is going on how can turkey be a small state but of course this book comes up with all these examples he, he talks about all these criteria and he tries to show that how turkey was deemed a small state not only by the turks themselves but more importantly also by most of the actors uh, who were fighting the second world war most of them looked at turkey as a small state so turkey spain are they small states can we compare them with bangladesh can we compare them with lesotho for example djibouti uh, singapore for that matter and of course can we compare them with the islands which are out there in the pacific so you have these small island micro states most of whom are located in in the pacific uh, can we really lump all of them together and say that okay all these countries make up what is called uh, small states okay so states state size clearly exists uh, uh, but of course uh, it really does not help you understand whether states are small uh, and of course whether states are not small so it's very difficult you cannot use this criteria to ultimately explain everything so what i do is i place states in the context of asymmetrical relationships so in other words we tend to assume that there is this power asymmetry whenever we talk about uh, small states and big states so relational power or to be more precise relational weakness is the main characteristic of small states so in other words when i look at uh, uh, when i try to traditionally when we look at small states we try to see we try to say that these these states are comparatively weak um, uh, are weak compared to other states and here and hence we call them we uh, small states so relational power ladies and gentlemen relational weakness uh, relational power brings about relational weakness and that is the main characteristic of small states so there is this asymmetrical relationship and this is what makes up um, uh, what we call small states okay so this brings us to this very important issue and, and that is the concept of power um, so if i say that i define small states on the basis of asymmetrical power relationship um that is they have less power compared to other countries and therefore i'm not looking at size but i'm looking more at the concept of power the ability to make others do certain things or to prevent others from doing some things to you that is what power is all about a, a very rough definition of power so i uh, we say that this means that power remains both a central and contested term in international relations the concept of power why is it contested and uh, the concept of power in ir has been dominated by realism and and of course whatever debates we have the teachers who come and teach us international relations whenever they talk about ir theory the first thing they will teach you is of course they will teach you realism and that is where the concept of power uh, why some states are powerful why the athenians can do whatever they like to the millions and the millions have to accept it um, this whole million dialogue that is often seen to be the foundation of modern international relations so defined by their very weakness small states struggle to gain respect in ir a feel long focus on international competition for power small states are seen as fragile creatures in the rough sea of international relations they were internally well suited for democratic regimes but externally they are helpless and constantly threatened by extinction so you live in what is what kotillo called motsonayam that is the rule of the fish the big fishes eat up the small fishes so yes <clears throat> you can be a happy country uh, yes the people are living in harmony with each other but of course uh, you have a uh, international system where you are a small fry and um, of course you are vulnerable to being eaten up by a powerful country a big country and that is what we are saying that they may be internally well suited for democratic regimes but externally helpless and constantly threatened by extinction so small states have been defined as lump of weakness okay 
So there is also the opposite concept, and that is the lump of power fallacy, that whenever you have power, automatically you can get things done. And this is also a fallacy. And that is why I give you the example of United States in Afghanistan or United States in, in Iraq, for that matter, OK? Uh, <clears throat> or in other parts of the world. It doesn't have to be a war. Even in foreign policy, of course, United States, the most powerful country in the world, often does not get what it wants. Okay, So there is this lump of power fallacy. But of course, whenever we talk about small states, we tend to see them as lump of weakness, which is, of course, the opposite of lump of uh, power fallacy. And of course, um, uh, uh, this lump of weakness does not recognize, and I emphasize on this, does not recognize their ability to exercise power, even if limited to specific issues, geographies, or relationships. So in other words, I'm making a counter argument. I'm telling all of you that please be careful. Do not underestimate yourself. Do not think that just because you are a, comparatively, others look up on you as a small state, whether in terms of geography, whether in terms of population, but that doesn't automatically mean you are powerless. So that is why I say that there is this lump of power fallacy. Small states are seen as lump of weakness, but it doesn't mean that big states are automatically powerful. So please remember, lump of power fallacy weakness, lump of weakness. The traditional definition that is of small states that that is they're weak they're about to be there they they exist only at the whim of powerful states they can become extinct at any point of time if the big powers want them uh, to go away. Uh, this is simply unable to explain the influence small powers have come to exert in world politics. The realities of both small states and power are more complex. Luckily enough. Uh, from the point of view of small states, exercise of power is more complicated than the mere ability of the strong to get what they want. In other words, I am asking you to rethink international relations. In fact, your teachers have already taught you this. They have pointed out to you time and again, whenever they talk about other IR theories, that is other than realism, they have not failed to point out to you that please remember one thing, my friends, International relations, the only currency in international relations is not power. There are other ways. And even when you look at power, it is very difficult to, to, uh, to explain power, to describe power. Power is not simply compulsory power. It is not simply military power. It is not something which you can easily quantify. There are many facets to power. One needs to take them into consideration. And I think this is why international relations is so complex. It is so mind boggling, but at the same time, why it is so interesting. So this is an argument which I hope that you will take away from today's class. And even if you do not remember anything, try to remember this, that um, international relations is not uh, black and white as we often are taught or often we perceive to be. It is much more complex than that. There are many shades which are out there, many shades of color, and we need to take them into consideration. So I'll go very quickly, ladies and gentlemen. As I said, Bengalis tend to talk a lot. Uh, the same also applies to me. So I'll try to finish within the stipulated time. So. Uh, so taking from what I have discussed previously, that there are many facets of power, this is what I want you to, again, understand that uh, whenever we look at the concepts of power in the studies of small states, we need to look at power uh, uh, in, in different ways, through different prisms. So one such prism is power as material resources. So what do we mean by this? This means Again, the traditional definition of small states has been typically based on the amount of resources a small state possesses. That is not very many. You look at Bangladesh, you look at Nepal, you look at Sri Lanka, for example, you look at Cuba, you look at Djibouti, you look at Singapore, you look at Qatar, for example, a tiny small state, low, very small population. Geographically, it really does not have much uh, to offer. Maybe in terms of uh, Nepal, you have the mountains, but you look at a country like Bangladesh, a flat delta country, no place where you can hide, um, no uh, geographical features which can prevent any invader from taking over this land. So these are things which automatically comes to you and you say that, okay, it really does not have much resources on the basis of which you can say that this is a powerful country. Okay, I'm talking about the concept of national power. So if population, GDP, territory, and military resources make a power great, it is the lack of these qualities which makes a state small. So as I said, I mean, the examples which I have given to you, okay, if you look at Bangladesh, for example, yes, okay, we have a lot of population, but often people will say that that is a curse, not a boon. A GDP, yes, it is rising, but still nothing compared to powerful states, territory, very small military resources, um, 
uh, we would like to be a very powerful country militarily, but of course, that is often not possible given that we also have to look at the economic realities of this. So therefore, Bangladesh is a small state. But this approach is referred to as the quantitative approach of international relations, okay? And we have to be very careful about the quantitative approach. So even when power is treated as the sum of material capabilities, small states are not helpless, particularly in economic terms. Small states may produce crucial commodities which can serve as an important base for power for even very small states. Strategic location can also function as a resource for small states, though perhaps one that cut both ways. Uh, so it can be a boon for you, it can also be a curse for you, um, as can be seen in Switzerland's defensive posture or Singapore's influence on regional shipping. One particular country I would like you to focus, I would like you to study as a case study, is the country, is an African country called Djibouti, uh, D J I. B O U T I, Djibouti. Djibouti is on the Horn of Africa. So it is wedged. It's a very small country wedged between two big countries, Somalia and Ethiopia. But if you look at the way Djibouti has been doing its foreign policy in recent years, it is a fascinating example of how a small state. In fact, Djibouti can also often be seen as even a city state for that matter, okay? How it has been able to go about doing its foreign policy and into how it has made it indispensable um, for, uh, for very powerful countries and how it has been able to survive uh, in a very difficult neighborhood. If you look at the relationship between um, Ethiopia and Djibouti, uh, GDP, uh, Ethiopia's population is 80 times larger than that of Djibouti. Its economy is huge. Its military power is is uh, is is much much greater than that of Djibouti. But still, Djibouti has not only been able to survive; it has been able to carve out a space for itself in in African politics and also in global politics. So. What matters over here is, of course, the location of Djibouti, the way Djibouti's statesmen, particularly their diplomats, they have gone about doing international relations, and of course, how Djibouti has placed itself, has presented itself uh, to the international community. So this is one example I would like you to, uh, to focus upon, I would like you to study. But of course, it also applies to other countries, okay? So as I said, Switzerland, uh, Singapore, Qatar, for example, how often these countries punch above their uh, their weight. Uh, Cuba is again one such example. So I'll, I'll talk about that in a moment. Okay. So that is one way of looking at power. Power as material resources, ladies and gentlemen. Okay. There's another way of looking at power and that is through interdependence and institutions. So what do I mean by this? Discussions about power and small states have drawn inspiration from liberal IR theory regarding interdependence and institutions. So I'm talking about uh, uh, Robert Cohen and um, Richard Nye, okay, and of course, there's this whole idea of complex interdependence. So, interdependence emphasis or complex interdependence de emphasizes military force and illustrates the complexity involved in the exercise of power. A liberal relationship approach makes it very clear that power, both the ability to change others' behavior and to resist pressure to change one's own, the definition which I just shared with you a few slides back can vary dramatically across issue areas. Complex interdependent increases the influence and maneuverability of small states uh, all in different issues. For example, in oceans and fishing issues, small states gained important influence through international organization, law, bargaining linkages, and even the symbolic use of force. Today, in international relations, you often use the term agenda setting. And you see that in today's world, particularly given the fact that you have a pandemic raging right now, uh, notice how mighty countries, uh, United States for, for that matter, the countries of West Europe, countries which, I mean, don't take it otherwise. Huh? For an average Nepali or for an average Bangladeshi, for us, it seems that heaven is the West. If we can go to West Europe, if we can go to United States, life is different for us, okay? That is often what we assume. But notice the pandemic tells us that what you perceive uh, to be the West, the way you look at them, uh, healthcare system, for example, uh, this, that, uh, society's resilience, um, uh, the race relationship within societies, all these have been starkly brought out into the light by the pandemic. In other words, we often have realized that the emperors have no clothes. 
So what does it tell us? It tells us that the traditional way we have looked at IR uh, by looking at a country like United States or West European countries is all powerful. And then you, when you have these huge death rates coming, these numbers, when you have that within these countries, you have a disproportionate population number of population of, of um, uh, uh, black or uh, other skin color, these people are being affected. When you see that economy is not as strongly placed as it is often made out to be. And when you realize that military power often does not make any sense when you're facing a global pandemic, suddenly you realize that the way we have been taught international relations, the way Thucydides has talked about international relations, that seems to be a somewhat problematic. In fact, ladies and gentlemen, let me remind you again that we should read Thucydides' history of the Peloponnesian War very, very carefully because Thucydides does not talk only about military power, ladies and gentlemen. He also reminds us that Athens suffered from a plague and it is this plague which ultimately brought about the destruction of Athens. So you have the famous line in History of the Peloponnesian War, where Thucydides writes that beyond all expectations, this plague fell upon us. And once this plague came to Athens, all of a sudden, out of the blue, suddenly everything Athens has aspired for, all this came to nothing. So it lost its greatest leader, that is Pericles, and with him, the death of Athenian strategy. Very quickly, within just next 20 years, Athens was ultimately absolutely extinguished as a great power by the Spartans. So please note, it is not military power, but germ power, that is these small microbes, which you cannot see, which ultimately brought a mighty country or a mighty entity called Athens down on its knees. Maybe we are seeing a similar uh, uh, a reality being played out in today's world. Of course, it may not have the same implications as the plague had for Athens, but still it is going to have an impact upon global politics. And I would like all of you to pay attention to the impact of the pandemic upon global politics, how it is going to affect the way we understand international relations, the way we do politics in the days ahead. So this is something which you need to remember. This is this particular slide talks about that. It is saying that we have to understand that we are living in a world today where simply by having armies, by having borders, you cannot fight a pandemic. You cannot find germs and diseases. WHO is constantly telling us that you need to have interdependence between countries, coordination between countries. Only then can you ultimately survive. You look at uh, New Zealand, a country which is far, far away. New Zealand only a two weeks back very clearly stated that it is free from COVID-19. Just three days back, it again pointed out that two visitors have come. Uh, and of course, they were, they were not uh, properly identified at the airport. They were able to slip through the airport. And of course, they've interacted with others. So think, uh, uh, New Zealand may now be looking at a new outbreak of pandemic. It may not happen. And I hope that it doesn't happen. But still, it just tells you that the way we perceive international relations, the way we perceive power, the way we look at security, all these are undergoing changes. And this is exactly what complex interdependence tells us. It came out in the 1970s, my friend, that when you have the Arab-Israeli um, war, and as a result of that, you have the oil embargo. And this pointed out to the world that even the Arab countries, they can come together, the, the small countries, apparently weak, and they can yield this tremendously powerful weapon called oil. The same also applies for pandemics today. And of course, it is not one country which is wreaking havoc, but nature. So the same also applies for, uh, uh, for uh, climate politics, for example. Can we really deal with climate politics? In fact, before this pandemic struck, uh, climate politics became the big thing. Whether you have Greta Thunberg, whether you have uh, the fire in Australia, that again pointed out to, and if you have read um, the March-April issue of foreign affairs, that was all about climate. That was that it was saying us that look, climate change is going to change global politics as we understand it. So it is time international relations looks at climate politics through a different prism. So the concept of power as we understand it complex power, meaning military power, compulsory power. Joseph Nye, Robert Cuban told us that 
guys, this is not how you do global politics. This is not how you can explain global politics. There are other things which you need to take into consideration. So power through interdependence and institutions, this is also a yardstick through which you can measure ultimately power. So, and this is what I have argued. So scholars have built on liberal IR theory to examine how small states use institutions to enhance security and to pursue interests. Scholars define institutional power as actors or actors' control of others in an indirect way, such as by forming rules and procedures. While large states have often led to efforts to create institutions in world politics, small states frequently turn to international law and institutions both as focal points for co cooperative efforts and as a means to limit the unilateralism of great powers. As such, institutions can be understood both as a site for the exercise of power, as much as of the literature on small states in the EU, and as a means of both power over others and power collectively with others. So if you look at the European Union, uh, small states particularly operating within the European Union, there again you see complex interdependence being played out. Again, I have given the example of Luxembourg, Singapore, and Qatar, how these countries have been able to present themselves. In fact, you can always argue that, sir, you're pointing out about powerful countries, Luxembourg. Um, so here again, you have a dichotomy. You're talking about a, a tiny country called Luxembourg, tiny country called Qatar, a tiny country called uh, Singapore, but then again, these examples are very difficult for you to accept because in your mind, these countries are not seen as small states, okay? So instead, if I have said that if you are looking at Bangladesh, if you're looking at uh, 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 the Pacific Island states, uh, uh, if you're looking at um, uh, Maldives, for example, but of course, the, even Bangladesh, Maldives, or these Pacific states, because we are going to uh, bear the brunt of, of climate change, of course, today and in the days ahead as more and more countries understand that something has really changed as far as climate is concerned. In fact, even the pandemic which we're experiencing today, this is nature's revenge of what we have done to Mother Earth. Then of course, you should ask yourself that, does this mean that international relations as we understand it today is going to change in the days ahead? Do we need to pay more attention to uh, nature? Do we need to pay, pay more attention to environmental politics? Is it going to become high politics? These are the questions which you need to ask yourself. Okay, so very quickly, then of course, there is another way of looking at power and that is through norms. At the very beginning of today's lecture, Professor Khadka pointed out that Bangladesh, Nepal, we are, we may be small countries, but, <coughs> sorry, but we play a very, very important role in international relations particularly by providing UN peacekeepers. Yes, there is a lot of controversy over peacekeepers. There are people who will say that uh, the rich countries pay money, so it is their, it is their money, but it is the uh, uh, blood of countries like Nepal, Bangladesh, India, Pakistan, which ultimately shows you the racial biasness of, of uh, United Nations peacekeeping. Yes, these arguments are there, but still notice how the world has come to know us through our uh, peace missions, through our uh, UN peacekeeping activities. And of course, this has a tremendous impact upon global politics. And that is why we say that the concept of power as related to norms, discourses, and ideas is mostly linked with the constructive, constructivist IR theory. They argue for normative power as the ability to, ch to shape or change what passes for normal in international relations. So why is it that some countries in the Nordic Sweden, Finland, uh, Denmark, Norway, why do we take them into consideration? Why are we taking South Asian countries into consideration? Now, today, uh, a country like Rwanda in Africa, only 20 years back um, uh, in 1994, you had the crisis in Rwanda, you had the genocide of one of the worst genocides of 20th century taking place. But today, Rwanda has been able to present itself as a responsible player in international relations. And one way of doing it has been a big contributor to UN peacekeeping. So this is it, ladies and gentlemen, the idea of norms. Norms play a very important role in global politics. Whether we like it or not, whether often these norms are being done in a very silent manner, unlike the military, they don't razzle and dazzle. But still, the important thing is that norms matter. The world runs on rules and regulations, okay? You go from country Y to country Z to country A, 
you are using the Warsaw Convention on Civil Aviation, the Montreal Convention on Civil Aviation. We often take these for granted, but without them, the whole world will come to a standstill. So the lawyers and the diplomats who work silently behind the scene to draft these rules and regulations, ultimately they play an equally, if not more important role in international relations than the soldiers and of course the machines, which often tend to dazzle us. Okay. This is what this argument is all about. So because of the ability to promote ideas has no relation to a state size. After all, the constructivist literature focuses on individuals, NGOs and IGOs as norm entrepreneurs. This form of power has drawn great attention in relation to small states. Examples of outsized roles uh, attained by small states, especially in Scandinavia, so the promotion of norms and conflict resolution and environmental protection is important. But again, I also would like to add Nepal, Bangladesh, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, India, and say that we have been active mediators, peacekeepers, and of course, we have also been building norms that delegitimize the use of force. And in our own way, we have been playing a very important role in international relations. So very quickly, let us move on. Again, I'm talking about the same thing in this slide. Uh, small states have acted as norm entrepreneurs in various areas. Small and middle powers are instrumental in advancing norms without, without norms without great powers uh, to support multilateral treaties, including a ban on anti-personal landmines. Small states have used their particular vulnerability to advance normative claims surrounding climate change. Others have argued that small and middle powers in Latin America particularly in the 70s and 80s, played an influential role in advancing specific conceptions uh, of uh, human rights, including economic and social rights in the immediate post-war period, even as great powers were opposed or ambivalent, or ambivalent. So this brings us, ladies and gentlemen, and I will go through this very quickly because we are running short of time. This brings us, brings us to three types of power. And I would like you to, uh, to again, think a bit about, about uh, uh, this particular slide. So we are saying that these three types of power are particular intrinsic power, derivative power, and collective power. So again, let me very quickly go through these, and then we can uh, look at the case that we call Bangladesh. So the concept of small state, and I'm talking about particular intrinsic power here, the concept of small state has long been defined according uh, to a particular conception of power. Power is possession or particular of particular material resources. So for example, you have a country which you say, that, okay, this is a powerful country. Why? Because it has these resources. However, in a world where anxiety about survival has decreased and where military coercion often no longer dominates the hierarchy, it has not gone away, but it is often not the dominant feature. The conceptualization of both power and small states are open to reinterpretation. Other ways of understanding power open analysts' eyes to the possibility of great influence from states long considered small. So what are we talking about? What does particular intrinsic power really mean? Power in international relations, when discussed in terms of capabilities or potential power, is usually synonymous with intrinsic power. Morgan Fu's criteria of power were largely intrinsic, population, territory, GDP, military strength, uh, national power, as your teachers have taught you, traditional uh, way of, of understanding power. While there is no, or as I said, the quantification of power, while there is no agreed upon weighting of these criteria, states are usually understood as great powers, middle powers, or small states based on the estimate of these factors, that is population, territory, GDP, and military strength. Those small states often lack many of the normal categories of capabilities. They possess particular forms of intrinsic power. What do I mean by this? Particular intrinsic resources are a potential base of power, but these resources, less so than a tremendous military, only become salient in, in world politics through their exercise. So maybe the thing is that it is there, but in a particular context, at a particular point of time, you suddenly realize that, okay, this country has power. So what do I mean by this? This means that not commonly understood as power, the resources fade from view until it is given means and applied to a specific goal or scope. The amount of power depends heavily on the context in which particular intrinsic power behavior is deployed. Now, what do I mean by this? What I mean over here is very simply this, ladies and gentlemen. 
the context is very very important how a country is able to use a particular resource it may be its geographical location it may be its natural resources it may be uh, uh, its certain skills but it depends on a particular context so it is it was there but it was not used but a particular context has emerged which suddenly makes you understand that okay i need to listen to this country now imagine imagine okay this is very important you need to imagine internationally this imagine climate politics becoming more and more important in the days ahead as we face an existential crisis and already the signs are there today countries which were previously skeptic today these countries are grudgingly uh, coming to admit that we need to take environment into consideration again in the post pandemic world you are going to see the issue of pandemics nature all these will become important so if these are important then maybe you will also see that a country which is at the very uh, edge of a climate disaster and that is of course that is of course uh, maldives uh, and of course the uh, micro states of of the pacific um, these countries voice will become louder and of course these voices will be heard in in the national in in international elections in various forums why because of the specific context and this is what we are arguing so oil was always there but before the invention of motor uh, internal combustion engine oil did not really matter okay you may have all the oil in the world but it doesn't matter uh, what matters is something else but once you have the internal combustion engine suddenly middle east became very important but because the middle eastern countries did not have the ability to use these resources on their own to, to tap these resources on their own it was the west which ultimately was able to make use of it but after gradually you have these nationalist revolutions taking place iran was of course a trailblazer with mossadegh then you have these middle eastern countries taking over their own resources and of course with the use of oil as a weapon in 1973 today you have hydrocarbon rich states even a country like russia which has uh, lost so many of its criteria of, of power but its resources particularly natural resources has allowed russia to play a very important role in today's global politics so we are talking about this that okay it is in this particular context that these countries have become important now what if we leave fossil fuel behind then of course this will have an implication also for the politics of these countries so this is something which you need to remember so we have panama which is because of its location again it was able to make use of the panama canal its geographical location and therefore it has become a very important country in global politics again singapore classic example uh, when singapore was uh, was leaving malaysia Uh, no one uh, i don't think the malaysians really regretted uh, singapore leaving malaysia but notice today uh, i'm sure that uh, there are so many people in malaysia who look at up uh, at singapore and and envy what singapore has done why it is because singapore is sitting on regional shipping lanes and it has been able to transform itself so again this is something which which you need to take into consideration again very very important but then again i have a question for you i want you to think ladies and gentlemen okay because this lecture is not about telling you or teaching you it is about asking you to think that is what you are supposed to do at phd or mphil level and that is why i am also taking so much of of time but i want you to to understand uh, uh, what i am trying to drive to drive at ask yourself this important question that if in the next 100 years or even in the next 50 years the arctic loses most of its ice and the shipping lanes are open which means that what man has wanted for a long long time that is the elusive northwestern passage that is suddenly open so from rotterdam to to shanghai you can come very quickly using the polar route and of course it means that you can make the journey in less time your ships uh, will use less fuel and of course this means that it becomes much more cheaper to ship goods from point a to point b now just ask yourself i want you to think ladies and gentlemen okay think that the, once the arctic route has opened what is going to be the importance of singapore ask yourself i do not want you to answer this right now i want you to think okay so this is what we are trying we are trying to say that yes power is there but this power comes from a particular context at a particular point of history it can change and it has changed 
So whether you're looking at the hydrocarbon rich states today, whether you're looking at Panama, whether you're looking at Singapore as a, as a global shipping hub, but these can ultimately change if we have fossil, if we leave fossil fuel behind, if the Arctic route opens and from Europe to China, uh, you can come without using the Suez Canal, without using the uh, uh, Strait of Malacca. Then, of course, the whole importance of the Indian Ocean that undergoes change. The Arctic becomes much more important because it is cheaper and easier to ship goods from Europe to the uh, powerful countries of East Asia, that is Korea, Japan, and China, by using the Northwestern route. Uh, so. You, you suddenly ask yourself that, hang on, this means that Singapore, this means that uh, 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 Egypt, for example, the Strait of Malacca, even Indian Ocean, about, about which we are today hearing a lot of things, all these may suddenly change. So this is what we're talking about when we talk about particular intrinsic, intrinsic, intrinsic power. And of course, I've given you the example of Qatar again very very important how a country has been able to use it is it is such a tiny country but it has been able to use its hydrocarbon particularly natural gas and of course very important ladies and gentlemen not only natural gas but its position as a hub okay an international hub you wherever you whenever you want to go to europe or to north america or to south america particularly for us you have to go through qatar the air hub the travel hub. So that is important. Look at Cuba. Cuba, again, a powerful country. But powerful country, how? A country which has been able to use, after the revolution, it has been able to use its tremendous advances in medical science to emerge as a very powerful country in global politics. In this pandemic, Cuba has won hearts of many countries in the world, including Europeans, by sending its doctors. Notice when the pandemic was raging in Italy, when even European Union countries were not able to help Italy, it was Cuban doctors who came to uh, uh, Slovakia, who came to uh, Central Europe, who came to Italy and played a very important role over there. Imagine that this is what power is all about. It is not only, Cuba doesn't count as a military power, but look at the power it has been able to yield in its foreign policy by using its trained doctors, okay? So this is something which I want you to understand. Again, Djibouti is a classic example. I've already talked about Djibouti. I would request all of you to, to study Djibouti's foreign policy very carefully because particularly for countries like Bangladesh and Nepal, Djibouti has a lot of lesson. We need to look at this country very seriously. Of course, it doesn't mean we can replicate Djibouti. That is not possible in international relations, but it is important. So very quickly, let me go on. I will um, <clears throat> uh, talk about, we have already talked about particular intrinsic power. I now would like to talk about a derivative power. So please look at the definition of derivative power. Lacking significant material capabilities of their own, small states may derive power that is why we call it derivative, by convincing large states to take actions that boost their interest. This has often been seen as the primary option for small states, the big influence of small allies. You make your bigger friend do things uh, which you cannot do on your own, but you can make him or her do it by influencing that particular country. So that is very, very important. The United States open pluralistic foreign policy I'm talking about lobbies here, for example. I'm talking here how countries can effectively use uh, the political establishment in Washington to ultimately push their own agenda. Uh, uh, Decision-making process allowed small state leaders to appeal to US missionary zeal or to, or to court narrow bureaucratic interests. If you look at the politics of lobbies in United States, whether it is the Greek lobby, whether it is the Armenian lobby, in the 1780s, and 80s, it was the Pakistan lobby. Today, the Indian lobby has become very powerful. The Israeli lobby, in fact, if I'm sure that you have read uh, Stephen Walt and, and uh, uh, John Mearsheimer's The Israel Lobby. If you have not read the book, I would suggest you to read it because that will tell you how important a role small states can have in America's foreign policy, particularly by the adroit use of America's domestic political realities, the use of lobby, congressmen, and how they can uh, turn policies in their favor. So please read this book very carefully. Stephen Walt and John J. Mearsheimer, The Israel Lobby. Okay, 
so Michael Handel, who wrote about strategic studies, he de he, he employed the term derivative who, and considered this the most important facet of small state strength, the diplomatic art of weak states to obtain, commit, manipulate as far as possible the power of other powerful countries in their own interests. In other words, the leaders of small states seek to act as the proverbial tail that wags the dog. Okay, the means of derivative power will vary according to a small state's goals and relationship with great power. In a particular friendly relationship, small states, uh, small powers might gain access to policy discussions. Um, NATO is a classic example of this, where even small states can often have a powerful impact upon the most powerful country within NATO, and that is the United States. If you look at today, if you look at the Baltic states, particularly Estonia, you will see that how very cleverly uh, the Baltic states, particularly Estonia, how they have made themselves, they have endeared themselves to the United States, particularly when you have a president like Donald Trump, and uh, how they have been able to tell or convince the United States that the Baltic states are very, very important for NATO. So America is now looking at countries like Germany, long allies, France, long allies, it often is not happy with them, but it is often more happy with countries like Poland, with Czech Republic, and of course the Baltic states, okay? Now, this doesn't mean that only geography is important over here. Yes, geography is very, very important. Poland, Czechos, Czech Republic, Baltic states, they're all around Russia. So definitely they're very important, but still, how these countries have presented themselves to the United States, that is very, very important. How the diplomats have been able to convince the Americans that, look, we are here for you. If the other European powers, the traditional European powers, they shun you, they tend to look at you in, a, in an arrogant way or in a condescending manner, we understand the importance of America. So we want to embrace America. And of course, America has also embraced them, particularly this the current administration. So this is what derivative power is all about, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, so I've given you the example. Portugal is there, but I have talked about the Baltic states. I've also talked about Poland, Czech Republic, and particularly the politics of NATO. This is very, very important. Of course, please remember, uh, you cannot always change. A small state cannot change the overall disposition of a great power. So in other words, a great power has its own interest. But still, the important thing is, uh, <clears throat> the important thing is that uh, you can bring about changes. So in practice, establishing derivative power require, of course, it, it is difficult. It is difficult to, to explain derivative power, particularly when you're talking about uh, IR, uh, because often you have a methodological uh, dilemma that can you really say uh, that country X, that is United States would have acted in this particular way if Poland or Czech Republic would not have approached it. In other words, would United States foreign policy proceeded regardless of Poland or the Baltic states' presence. So these are often very difficult to, to, uh, to prove. So there is a methodological problem, particularly if you're doing a PhD. Uh, but please remember, there are classic examples where countries have been able to use powerful states to further their interests. And of course, look at the example of Colombia, how Colombia has been able to use United States, particularly in its policy vis-a-vis -vis Venezuela. This is very interesting. Uh, Colombia embraced the United States in such a way that often Venezuela became the enemy of the United States, not because it was pursuing policies which were inimical to the United States, but often because Colombia wanted America to feel that Venezuela is um, sort of an anomaly. It is something which cannot be, or a pariah. Okay. And you have the classic example of Taiwan, a country which is able to punch above its weight because of its close ties with with United States. And often how the Taiwanese have been able to use the American democratic establishment, particularly the lobbies, particularly the senators, the congressmen, and various uh, in, uh, uh, groups within United States political establishment and further the interest of Taiwan. I've already given you the example of Israel. And I suggested that you please read carefully the Israel lobby book, not simply to understand how Israel has manipulated American policy, but more importantly, how derivative power is used in foreign policy. So uh, you, you will get a good theoretical understanding of this. So based on this relationship, this form of power offers the opportunity for a small state to pursue and perhaps accomplish more objectives that, could, uh, that would otherwise be beyond its grasp. Okay, so now we enter the third uh, and last 
portion of the theoretical discussion and then I will move on to Bangladesh very quickly. I'm sorry for taking up so much of your time, but I thought that uh, since we're talking about small states, we must have a good theoretical understanding. Of course, it will help, as I said, it will not answer all your queries, but it will help you understand maybe things better. And you would, after today's class, you would look at small powers in a very different way. So if the fine. Sorry. Please sorry. go ahead. It's absolutely fine. Thank you, Professor Katsuna. Thank you very much. Um, so if the fundamental base of the derivative power is the relationship between the small state and a great power, the fundamental base of collective power is the relationship between a small state and associated non-great powers. In other words, small states of the world unite, to, to paraphrase the Marxist phrase, okay? It means that I'm not looking at a great power. It means I'm looking at powers which are more like me. Bangladesh looks at Nepal. Uh, Professor Khadga, at the very beginning of today's class, he said something which really touched me. He said that we are like brothers, and that is so important that you often see that Nepalese, Bangladeshis, whenever in any part of the world, they tend to come together and tend to feel that, okay, there is something which connects us. Maybe, yes, it may be our smallness. It may be our particular geographical reality. It may be about uh, the challenges and the opportunities we all face together. So, this again is something which is which is there in international relations and we call it collective power. That is the relationship between a small state and associated non-great powers. Collective power can either be compulsory or institutional. In compulsory, it means a grouping of small states directly pressures a large state to change its policy through threats or promises. You can have the countries of Latin America all coming together, applying pressure upon United States, saying to the United States that no, you cannot do this, okay? You cannot force Panama, you cannot take over the Panama Canal. You can always, you cannot hold it for an indefinite period. When Panama regained the ownership of the Panama Canal, one important role was played by the countries of South America. They all came together and through OAS, Organization of American States, they applied pressure upon uh, America and they said that, no, this is something you cannot do. Yes, there are other issues also at play, but this also played a very important role. So we call this compulsory power. So more frequently, this will be mediated by institutions and may give formal protection and voice to small states. As I said, OAS, Organization of Africa, uh, of American States, okay? So that played an important role in this particular case, particularly when we talk about compulsory collective power. But then again, there is also something called institutional, uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, institutional, sorry, institutional uh, uh, power. So again, notice compulsory power is there, countries coming together, applying pressure upon a powerful country to threats or promises. But when I say that there is another collective power, I'm saying that this collective power, it is usually done through institutional means. That is by using institutions and ultimately forcing a country to change its policy. So let me give an example. I've already given you the example that even though uh, uh, in terms of uh, Panama Canal, uh, collect, uh, uh, compulsory collective power was in display, but it was displayed through institutional collective power mechanism. And that is through the Organization of American States. Notice again, one example, I've already given this example too. I'm repeating it again, Estonia. Very interesting case, okay. Estonia, a country which is living beside a giant called Soviet Union, or called Russia. Uh, Nepal, Bangladesh, often we feel that we are the only countries or we are some of the countries, few countries in the world which faces a big neighbor. That is not the case. Many countries all over the world, even developed countries, they face neighbors which are asymmetrical in nature. They're huge. Okay, These are like 600, 800, 900 pound gorillas. Uh, I mean gorilla not in a derogative manner, but just to make you understand it. So if you look at Finland, if you look at the Baltic states, you see the, the, the shadow of Russia looming over them. There is this very famous saying by a, a former, uh, a, an old Mexican president. He said that Mexico is such an unfortunate country. It is so close to United States and so far from God. So poor Mexico. So that also applies to Estonia. That may also apply to the Baltic states. It may also apply to uh, so some of the South Asian countries or Southeast Asian countries for that matter. China becomes more and more powerful. Okay. So living beside a big country is always a challenge. Ask Djibouti, ask Cuba, for example. Okay. Ask the, some of the Latin American countries. So 
my argument over here is that notice how Estonia used collective power, but it used it through institutional means. How did it do so? It became member of NATO, but once it became a member of NATO, it decided that it is going to embrace NATO in such a way that America is going to find it somewhat indispensable. So what does it do? It very quickly raises its military spending. So the promise which the NATO countries, which President Donald Trump wants the uh, Europeans to do, that is give a particular portion, that is 2% of their GDP to NATO or for defense spending. This is something which Estonia did, even though it had other much more pressing issues. Estonia said that, no, I'm going to use this. I'm going to meet the NATO guideline for military spending, even though much more older, responsible, quote unquote, responsible European countries are falling behind. They've never done this. Germany, for example, France, for example, but Estonia made it a point. Then Estonia says that because it suffers often from cyber attacks from a very, very powerful neighbor, Estonia hosted NATO's Center on Cyber Security. And inside the EU, it has blocked policies which, we, which may enhance energy dependency on Russia. Why? Because it, it lives beside this huge country. It knows the travails, the challenges of living beside a large country. Often you are crushed. Even if the other country moves a bit just to make a space for itself, it does not... It is not that it dislikes you. It is just that it wants to move, sit a bit more comfortably. Suddenly you feel that you're quashed. So that is the dilemma of small states, okay? So Estonia said that, okay, what I will do is I will use collective power, but collective power through institutional means to ultimately ensure that my interests are protected. So America embraces me more, NATO embraces me more. EU also does not take any policy which will ultimately become uh, or which may ultimately circumscribe Estonia's uh, uh, room for maneuver. So the combination of rules and negotiating strategies can help a small states minimize the effects of asymmetry. So the example of Antigua and Bermuda, how they won their case against the United States at every level of the World Trade Organization. This is again something which is there. Estonia is there, uh, of course, uh, the small states of the Pacific, they have now come together, uh, uh, coalesced around the threat of climate change in order to organize a project of global scope with deep economic ramifications for established and, and emerging powers. Okay, So small states have been able to gain diplomatic state, support of other small states to advance their particular causes internationally. In this case, the supportive countries not necessarily have a direct benefit for their support, though they might expect reciprocal support or indirect benefits in, in the days ahead. Again, I've given you the example of the Panama Canal and how the Latin American and South American countries came together and, and applied pressure upon the United States uh, with regard to the Panama Canal case. Okay, so again, um, somewhat of a, a theoretical discussion on collective power and I, I will end over here this whole the, the theoretical uh, uh, discussion so when a fundament when fundamental interests are at play in near term a great power is likely to override a coalition of states if it is an existential crisis of course the great power will not listen to you however coalitions can exercise meaningful influence in other ways. First, they may nudge other states towards a desired position of the small state, even where they cannot face a, a reversal. So you push it towards a particular position. Okay, it will not totally embrace you, but there have been certain changes. And remember, even certain changes mean a lot for small states. Second, when other states' interests and views are poorly defined, they can play a significant role in affecting agendas and influencing definition of interest. So in other words, they can give shape to an agenda. In other words, they can become a sort of an agenda setter, which is very, very important in international issues. Finally, coalitions of small states can signal limitations or vetoes on larger states' actions. In this case, the sheer number of small states can give them a legitimacy that outstrips their share of the world population. And the classic example of this is the International Criminal Court, where a lot of countries, even United States, particularly even uh, just a few days back, you saw the position United States had with regard to ICC. But still, what has happened is that most of the countries of the world have come together and said that, no, we want to do this. Therefore, United States may today refuse to take ICC into consideration. But please remember, deep inside, it feels that it is doing something which goes against uh, 
the the desire of most of the countries of the world and there are uh, honorable diplomats here who will tell you that recognition honor face these things mean a lot of things in international relations traditionally we assume because we live in a realist world we tend to assume that everything or we try to quantify everything in terms of power but in international relation because of norms because of rules and regulations these things matter how a country behaves is it a responsible country does it behave in a proper manner does it honor its treaties obligations does it go by uh, international law these things matter tremendously in international relations it may not matter for a president like donald trump uh, because he caters to the domestic audience but remember people working in the state department people working in even national security they will at one point of time sit down and write an article in foreign affairs or foreign policy ruining the fact that america today has become an irresponsible power and i would suggest that if you read articles in foreign affairs and foreign policy journal particularly you will see that even great uh, somewhat hawkish members of the uh, of the administration who only a few months back were holding important positions in trump administration today they're coming back sitting and writing and saying that we made mistakes and particularly our mistake has been that we are not taking the international community into cognizance we are tearing down the institutions which have been built up after the second world war very very systematically and very importantly these were built up so but today we are tearing them down with our own hands and this ultimately will bring disaster in the long run so this is what collective power is all about ladies and gentlemen apparently it is not uh, fashionable but please remember fashion tends to go out with each season you need things which stay and this is what it is all about international norms rules regulation treaties treaty obligations these matter in the long run i'll give you one example and and then i will move on to bangladesh think of what in america has done with regard to the nuclear treaty which was signed with iran yes it was not a very good treaty particularly if you look from the western perspective if you look at it and of course there were strong opponents of this treaty particularly israel and saudi arabia they were adamant against this treaty okay but it was a treaty which gave the world something to rely upon okay yes it is not the best of world but then again in life you do not get the best of everything so international diplomacy is also like life you give something you get something and you move on with life otherwise it is not possible you cannot have the best of everything in 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 this world so in a similar fashion there were a lot of criticism with regard to the nuclear treaty but what happened subsequently was that yes it was a treaty but still it was better than nothing it put a sort of a, 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 a roadblock or a speed breakers as far as iran's nuclear uh, quest for nuclear weapons are concerned but then what happened you have a president who came out who got elected and he said that this is a bad treaty i'm pulling out just like that what does it mean it means that from now on no country in the world will think again of signing a deal with united states particular nuclear deal with united states knowing fully well that this is a country which does not Uh, go by its treaty obligations so when you look at our north korea which constantly violates whatever it has signed you ask yourself that uh, the north koreans are are very clever diplomats they have looked at what america has done in iran and they have understood fully well that this is a country which you cannot depend upon even if they have put the president signature on a piece of paper which is called a treaty so it has implication ladies and gentlemen okay so as i said it may not be fashionable but then again fashion does not last fashion lasts only a season you have to move on with life and that is why rules regulation norms treaties are so important okay so now very quickly i'll talk about bangladesh and then of course i'll be happy to have some question answer you know about bangladesh so there is not much to say in all of your uh, classrooms in in your computers i'm sure you have a map of nepal and the map of nepal will uh, automatically also show bangladesh because we are so close only a tiny strip of indian territory prevents nepal and bangladesh from coming together otherwise we would have flourishing trade so in terms of geographical location bangladesh is at the northern tip of the bay of bengal which is not very far from the busiest sea lanes of the world so it's a bridge between south and southeast asia also bangladesh is one of the fastest growing economies among the least developed countries with a population of 165 million or 170 million okay 
it is a growing market and the country offers a significant investment opportunities. We still have a long way to go, but please remember from 1971 until today in 2020, we have a lot of problems uh, there and these problems may persist in the days ahead, but uh, in 1971, the population of the country was about 70 million, out of which nearly 85% of the country's population lived below the poverty line. Today, the population is about 160 million or 170 million, more than double. Today, the number of people living just before the pandemic, living below the poverty line came down to about 25% a tremendous achievement by any means, okay? It doesn't matter whether uh, from which political party you come from, whatever is your political affiliation, but the fact that Bangladesh has made remarkable strides in the development sector, this is something which every Bangladeshi will tell you. And you can feel this. When I was young, growing up in Dhaka, rickshaw pullers, for example, uh, or when I went to my village home if once a year, um, uh, particularly during winter, I could see poverty all around me. Rickshaw pullers often pulling their rickshaws, just wearing a lungi and that is it. Whether it was a cold weather, uh, it was cold day or whether it was a rainy day or it was a sunny day. Today, more or less, you will not see a Bangladeshi rickshaw puller who is without a t-shirt or even trouser. And of course, he also carries a cell phone. A country of 165 million people, but a country where you have about more than 60, 160 million mobile phones. Yes, maybe not everyone uh, uh, has a cell phone or maybe there are people who are using two or three cell phones, but still it is a fact that cell phone has reached most of the country's population and they can afford to talk. What does that tell you? It tells you that development has taken place in the country. Per capita income has risen. Uh, people eat better, live better, of course, the healthcare system may, there are problems, there are problems all over the world, but we have made tremendous uh, progress. So this is something which you need to remember. Um, and of course, uh, the garment sector has been a great success. Migration has been a great success for us. Uh, so these are there. So the country offers a outward looking foreign policy in order to foster greater trade, investment and diplomatic links. Now, but at the same time, please remember, we are a country which has to take India into consideration whenever we talk about our foreign policy. It doesn't matter which which uh, leader is in power, which political party, whether it is BNP, whether it is Army League, or even if I uh, become the foreign minister of the country, okay, uh, I will have to take India into consideration. So it is significant for India for a variety of reasons, and these are economic, security, political, and foreign policy. So. Uh, 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 although Bangladesh is a relatively small country, it is important to India in terms of security. Um, uh, uh, and of course, I will talk about India's, uh, Bangladesh's importance for Indian security from three dimensions. Number one, a friendly government in Dhaka can pose considerable security risk for India's Northeast region. So you have the seven sisters, you have a China, which is uh, breathing down Arunachal Pradesh. Uh, so you have uh, disputed territory over there. You have uh, problems in Myanmar, for example. So, and of course you have a tiny corridor, which is called the narrow corridor, which is called the Shiliguri corridor. And suddenly you realize, wow, Dhaka is so important. Bangladeshi territory is so important for, for Northeast India. And of course, this territory may also be used uh, to ferment trouble in Northeast India, and of course, Northeast Indian territory can also be used to form and trouble for Dhaka. The cat and mouse game is there, but of course, please remember this is not something which is unique to India Bangladesh relations. It is something which happens all over the world. But the bottom line is that Dhaka is important, a friendly Bangladesh is important for India if it wants to take India's Northeast India into consideration, particularly security dimension. Secondly, India, of course, when you talk about particularly extremism, when you talk about terrorism, uh, India can be more vulnerable to terror threats if it does not obtain Dhaka's cooperation. Of course, the same also applies for Bangladesh, that if India's uh, cooperation is not there, uh, it can become very difficult for us, whether it is in the Chittagong Hill Tracks, whether it is um, transnational criminal organizations or even violent extremist groups, uh, or even for that matter, the rise of populism, uh, nationalist, uh, hyper-nationalism in India, these can have implications for, for Bangladesh. So you need uh, India's cooperation in this regard. Thirdly, New Delhi considers Bangladesh as a part of its security sphere. Now I know that as a Nepali or as a Bangladeshi, this is not something which we like, but of course, please remember um, when we talk about our foreign policy, we need to 
often put aside our emotions and we need to look at things in a dispassionate manner. India has embraced or it has, uh, 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 it is an heir to the Mughal and to the British Raj's tradition of looking at India's security through particular prisms. So that is why Afghanistan is important for, uh, uh, for uh, India. In the, same, in the way the Mughal emperors looked upon Afghanistan um, as very important for their security. As the British looked at ne Afghanistan, as they looked at Nepal, Bhutan, or Tibet, um, or Myanmar, and of course Singapore, or East Africa, the Indian Ocean, through their own prism for ensuring India's security, I'm talking about the British Raj, after 1945, the Brown Shahibs who have taken over the South Bloc and the North Bloc, they also tend to look at India's security through these prisms. So please, ladies and gentlemen, whenever you study India's policy, do not forget to read the Raj's security policy with regard to South Asia and with regard to Africa and of course also Southeast Asia. Why is Andaman Island so important? Why is India so adamant about having good ties with Singapore, with Vietnam? These are the questions which you need to ask yourself. And these questions were raised and discussed way back in 1944-45 by a person by the name of Olaf Kaure, who was an ICS officer, an Indian civil service officer, but he was a, a strong uh, a believer in foreign and security policy and he was a he was a, a student of, of these subjects and he formed a group which is called the round table which also publishes a journal the round table journal which is published by the commonwealth uh, secretariat a very old and very famous journal um, in international relations now there they argued that india's security policy does not depend only within india's borders it depends on what is called the inner fence and the outer fence. The outer fence are countries like Iran, uh, East Africa, and of course, all the way up to Vietnam, Philippines, and <clears throat> Cambodia and, and uh, uh, Singapore. The inner fence is, of course, countries like, well, at that time, Bangladesh was not an independent country. Partition had not taken place. But they were looking at Nepal. They were looking at Bhutan. They were looking at Tibet. And of course, they were looking also uh, at Myanmar. Remember, it was way back in 1944-45 that Olaf Kaure and his group, they, they were thinking, remember, this was a time when China was absolutely shattered. It was a country in turmoil. But they looked at China and they, they predicted that China is going to become a very powerful country and it is going to have security implications for India. Now, this is what I want you to understand that when I make the third point that New Delhi considers Bangladesh as a part of its security sphere that is within the inner security fence, this is not something which is only a reflection of the Indira doctrine or India doctrine, but it is a continuation of a security policy which was practiced by India's former rulers, be it uh, the British Raj or be it the, uh, the Mughals of, of India. So this is something which we need to take into consideration. You must always look at what the other side is thinking, my friends, okay? You may not like them, uh, and that goes for every other country. I, an Arab may not like an Israeli, an Iranian may not like a Saudi, but you have to understand them. That is very, very important. So Sun Tzu comes into play. Know yourself and know the other side and you can win a hundred battles without fighting. So knowledge, again, is very, very important. So Bangladesh is also important for India for economic reasons. Um, for years and years, for decades, uh, India has sought transit facility. In other words, a sort of a corridor facility for to economically connect its isolated Northeast India, which many identify as Bangladesh locked. Okay, Bangladesh's foreign policy is India locked. We are surrounded on three sides by India. The Indian Ocean can also be blocked off by the powerful Indian Navy. So our foreign policy, we are taught in first year uh, honors at Dhaka University, we are taught that Bangladesh's foreign policy is India locked. This is a reality. So on the other hand, there is this also this strong argument which says that yes, but Bangladesh also has an advantage, a trump card, and that is it can also block Northeast India. So it is Northeast India is India blocked, and therefore India needs this region, that is Bangladeshi territory, to maintain a connection with its mainland. Sorry, there is a typo over here. Um, uh, I'm, I'm sorry for that. But of course, please remember that it was very difficult for India because of political, domestic political compulsions, particularly within Bangladesh. It was very difficult for India to obtain this facility uh, to have access to Northeast India. But this has changed. Uh, after 2009, when the present government came to power, it has decided that 
you must have pragmatism whenever it comes to foreign policy and it has allowed Indian goods uh, and, and uh, transport to traverse Bangladeshi territory and enter Northeast India. Of course, please remember, uh, India is also pursuing Myanmar uh, for ensuring unimpeded access to Northeast India. It, it does not want to be dependent on the Shiliguri corridor, but because of, of, of strategic reasons, okay? So, uh, Bangladesh also holds, this is the economic reason, Bangladesh also holds considerable significance for India's foreign policy and e e economic diplomacy. In the past, New Delhi emphasized economic diplomacy as a focus of its foreign policy. India's look east, which has later on been transformed into act east policy, is a case point in this regard. By pursuing the act east policy, New Delhi seeks to build connectivity, trade, and investment relationship with East and Southeast Asia. To successfully pursue this policy, New Delhi needs Dhaka's cooperation because of Bangladesh's geographical location. Compared to India, on the other hand, China does not hold vital security or economic interest um, uh, um, as far as Bangladesh is concerned. However, the country is important in the broader context of India's internet of China's international strategy that has political, economic, and foreign policy dimensions. In other words, Bangladesh is not a pressing concern. It is not a neighbor uh, totally connected to China. And therefore, you cannot simply over uh, not take Bangladesh into consideration, unlike India. But Bangladesh fits into China's overall strategy, okay, or its grand strategy. Uh, so, with its rapid economic growth, China's national international interests have expanded manifold. As noted above, this has led to China to launch the BRI, that is the Belt and Road Initiative, to safeguard and promote its external interests. So as China seeks greater engagement and political influence to implement the BRI, Bangladesh as a neighboring country becomes very important. So notice that there is a difference between China's, uh, Bangladesh's importance to China and Bangladesh's importance to India. Uh, and this is something which we need to take into consideration whenever we try to understand Bangladesh's foreign policy. So very quickly, um, it is very significant that the history of bilateral relationship between India, between Bangladesh and its two powerful neighbors, this must be understood to understand Bangladesh's foreign policy as the Sino-Indian competition uh, pans out, as the, sorry, as the Sino-Indian uh, 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 competition uh, uh, takes shape in, in the region. Now, as many of you know, Bangladesh and India have a checkered history of bilateral relationship. So uh, while the, the relationship between China and Bangladesh has been more or less steady uh, since uh, the establishment of diplomatic relations uh, since 1975. Now, uh, very quickly, please remember that uh, I, I will talk about this very briefly. As many of you know that in uh, Bangladesh was a part of Pakistan before 1971, uh, due to uh, economic and political uh, differences uh, due to the lack of lopsided development and of course due to uh, 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 the absence of an outlet for Bengali nationalism uh, to find its voice particularly through political representation uh, the Bengali nationalist struggle ultimately culminated in the war of 1971. Now in 1971 India used uh, uh, of course uh, gladly helped bangladesh uh, to to uh, to ultimately become a free country srinath raghavan has written quite a few books on on the 1971 war i would suggest you to read his his book uh, uh, 1971 the global war um, which is about the bangladesh war that will give you a clear understanding of what india's strategic and foreign policy compulsions were and also uh, human rights uh, interest because you have a large number of refugees on Indian territory. But of course, it is security and strategic compulsions and foreign policy compulsions which ultimately pushed India to take part in the 1971 war and help in the creation of Bangladesh. Now, the Bangladesh which came out in 1971 was seen as very friendly towards India. Uh, and of course, we signed friendship treaty and everything. But beneath this friendship, beneath this carpet, or behind the thick curtains, you had difficulties which emerged very quickly. Okay, uh, and of course, uh, very quickly, these also transformed into a strong anti-Indian uh, 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 
uh, orientation as far as the population were concerned. So the population particularly became quite anti-Indian uh, in its outlook uh, because of what was happening on the ground. You had smuggling, you had uh, the water issue, you had the issue of trade. Um, you also had this perception that uh, India was playing a particularly uh, an outsized role in Bangladesh's foreign and defense policies. So as, as a result of this perception, uh, the, the relationship between Bangladesh and India, it gradually uh, started feeling strained. But of course, uh, once you have the tragedy of 15th August 1975 taking place, uh, when the countries, again, Professor Khadka has mentioned this, uh, he talked about Bangabandhu Sheikh Mujibur Rahman. Uh, so with the assassination of Bangabandhu Sheikh Mujibur Rahman and the coming of the military to power in Bangladesh, Bangladesh's policy towards India took a very different turn. Um, the military regimes, they espoused Bangladeshi nationalism, where Islam played a role, where anti-India uh, uh, issue ultimately was pushed to the forefront. And also at the same time, Bangladesh decided to forge closer ties with other countries, namely China. So as Bangladesh grew more closer to the Middle Eastern countries, to United States and to China, uh, Bangladesh's relationship with India suffered. Uh, again, trade, water issues, uh, the problem in Chittagong hill tracks, where you have the uh, insurgents fighting the Bangladesh state, um, the hill people, that is, the Shanti Pahini and others. And of course, they had their bases um, uh, across the border. So as a result of all this, uh, un uh, throughout the 19 from the mid-1970s onwards until 19 mid-1990s, that is when democracy was restored. And of course, uh, 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 Amili came to power uh, in 1996. Democracy, democracy was restored in 1990. Uh, you had the first elections, but it was won by BNP, which was perceived to be uh, a, a government which is not always uh, 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 in tune with India's uh, 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 voice uh, with regard to uh, Bangladesh's uh, security and foreign policy. But in 1996, you have Aumi League, which came to power for the first time. And this was a, this is a party which is historically perceived to have very close ties with, with India. And after that, of course, the relationship uh, took, uh, went on a different level. Uh, uh, a, a treaty was signed with regard to the Chittagong Hill Tracks. A treaty was also signed with regard to the sharing of water. But the water issue still persists. Um, uh, but then again, all this changed again after you have a change of government in 2001. One. This continued until 2005, 6. Uh, uh, then you have a military uh, a sort of a hiatus. After 2009, the present government has been in power. So for the last 12 years, and uh, in this during this time, we have seen that Bangladesh's relation with India it has blossomed. It has moved on to a very different level, which has not been seen uh, seen since 1975. And as a result, uh, of course, Bangladesh is now perceived to be uh, to, uh, to have very good ties with India. But at the same time, please remember, uh, Bangladesh's relation with China is also very interesting. That even though the China was embraced by Bangladesh's military rulers after 1975, more as a as a balancer against India, but the Aumili government very adroitly, once it came to power in 1996 and later on after 2009, it has ensured that Bangladesh's relationship with China continues at the same level. So Bangladesh and China relationship, as I said, I mean, notice I pointed out that Bangladesh and China's relationship has been steady. And I think that this is a big uh, uh, achievement on, on part of the present government that it has not allowed its... Uh, 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 friendship with India and, of course, um, uh, its own um, image um, that it, it, is a it is a country which was, uh, it's a party which was historically not very close to China. It has not allowed these to ultimately impede Bangladesh-China relations. Uh, so Bangladesh and China today, uh, they have a, a huge amount of trade. Of course, this is in favor of China. Um, China is Bangladesh's largest, uh, Bangladesh imports the highest amount of goods. It is Bangladesh's largest importer. But please remember our largest exporting country, the uh, country which takes the largest amount of export from Bangladesh is uh, United States. But we import the highest amount of goods from, from China. And of course, 
foreign direct investment comes mostly mostly from other countries egypt uh, hong kong uh, singapore uh, these are the countries which have invested more in in bangladesh okay uh, so china is bangladesh's largest arms supplier as well as the country's largest trading partner Bang china constitutes 26.5 percent of the country's total international trade so you can see that it, it's a big thing really in 2016, uh, the president, Chinese President Xi Jinping, he, in his visit to Dhaka, he pledged 24.5 billion uh, US dollars for infrastructure development. This is the largest sum ever pledged by to Bangladesh by any single country. And Bangladesh has also signed uh, various treaties on this and on, on cooperation. Uh, China's BRI projects in South Asia have alarmed India, which is which which perceives it as Chinese encroachment in its backyard. Also, there is a growing sense of encirclement in, Indi in New Delhi since China began to implement the BRI and build port and other facilities in South, China, in, in South Asia and in the Indian Ocean region. Now, particularly uh, as China uh, went about uh, developing the port facilities in Bangladesh, please remember, Bangladesh is, its international trade is booming and the volume of trade has increased manifold. But our problem is that we have only one deep sea port in Chittagong, and it is not really a deep sea port because the ships have to wait in the outer anchorage and then lighter vessels have to carry this to the port, which is located inside the river. So it is not really a deep sea port. Bangladesh desperately needs a deep sea port because the projected amount of trade uh, which the economists see uh, coming, um, being going to be experienced by Bangladesh in the next 20 to 25 years, that will not be possible for Chittagong port or even Mongla port to handle uh, uh, given their present infrastructure. So a deep sea port is must. And that is what the Chinese wanted to do. They wanted to establish a deep sea port at a place called Shonadia uh, in the coastal areas of Bangladesh. But of course, as I said, that uh, this was not something which was seen uh, or, or uh, taken lightly by New Delhi, by uh, Japan, by United States. And of course, uh, later on, this, this project was ultimately scuppered and uh, China was offered uh, another uh, position where uh, uh, deep sea, uh, where uh, port facilities and other infrastructure development uh, projects, these were given to, to the Chinese. The Japanese have started developing uh, uh, a, 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 a port project in a place called Matarbari. Um, and of course, the Chinese are also working in another project at a place called Al Paira, which is a, a bit far off from, from Shonadia. Okay, and of course also um, uh, India has also started um, uh, various connectivity projects and also various economic projects, namely um, uh, power plants in, in the Shundarban region. And uh, also it has pushed the idea of uh, BIMSTEC um, uh, forward um, as a way of, um, uh, of the, uh, ensuring that um, the South Asian countries, they ultimately uh, cooperate more on, on connectivity. So the problem for Bangladesh is that um, this geo-economic competition between the two powerful Asian countries has thrown Bangladesh into a quandary. The challenges of Bangladesh are not only they not only derive from its size, but they are also component by the country's uh, geographical location. As I've already pointed out, to the do not forget, uh, as we are taught in IR 101, that Bangladesh is India locked. Of course, competition between the two powerful states not only produces challenges for smaller states; it may also generate opportunities, and that is what I have been talking about when I discuss that. Please do not get carried away by this idea that small states are vulnerable, we are helpless, we are not. We, in international relations today, there is a growing realization that country, small states, um, number one, the whole idea of small states is problematic. Number two, even if you accept this uh, for the sake of argument, small states can do a lot of things on their own. So they are not helpless, okay? So the same also applies for a, for a country like Bangladesh. So how is Bangladesh coping with the challenges and seizing opportunities that generate uh, that geo-economic competition between China and India has generated. So let us go through this very quickly. Dhaka has thus far managed to uh, manage the challenges and opportunities of Sino-Indian competition skillfully. It has adopted a balanced approach 
in which it has tried to tap the benefits of China's BRI funding while remaining very sensitive to the core concerns of New Delhi. Now, please try to understand what I'm saying over here. Bangladesh is suffering or it is about to suffer from what is called the middle income trap. That is, uh, when we were uh, a least developed country, we had access to grants, concessional loans, uh, 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 very uh, 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 soft uh, uh, financial packages. But as the country's productivity has increased, as the country's per capita income has gone up, as our GDP has risen, and as the United Nations gradually has pushed us further and further up the uh, the development ladder, uh, Bangladesh today is seen as a country which is making strides, and it is now seen as a country which is a sort of a lower income middle country, lower middle income country. Uh, the problem for this is that, of course, as all economists will tell you, the problem is that this means that various facilities, like your GSP facility, for example, for access to developed markets in European Union or U United States for that matter, these are coming under uh, pressure, number one. Uh, often these facilities are taken away. Uh, number two, uh, of course, your access to concessional loans and grants to capital, in other words, that is also coming under uh, strain. So this ultimately leads to what is called the middle income trap. And the trap is that uh, uh, people expect you to uh, to act more like you are affluent. Now you can take loans at market rates, for example. But deep down inside, you know that you still haven't reached that level yet. Yes, you have made tremendous strides, but you still need uh, uh, certain facilities which will uh, which will put you on a much more uh, stronger uh, footing and only then can you uh, access maybe loans and other uh, opportunities at, at, at a market level so as a result Dhaka's dilemma is exactly this right now and this is where China becomes so important that China is offering funding which other other countries have not been willing to or which are unable to to provide and that is why bangladesh has has uh taken a step forward towards China. But at the same time, it is also very, very aware, uh, particularly the present government, because of its close ties, um, uh, 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 both historical, personal, and also structural ties with, with, uh, with India. It is, uh, it is extremely aware of India's uh, security perception. It is aware of India's security needs. In other words, it is in, in sync with India's um, uh, 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 policy with regard to China. And that is why it is very careful that even if it approaches China, it knows that it has to take India into consideration. And, and there is nothing wrong with this. I, I find it to be a much more pragmatic policy. So it may appear to be siding with India in the Sino-Indian uh, uh, Sino competition when it when, for example, it said that, okay, we are not going to allow the Chinese to go for the Shoradia deep sea project, but a careful analysis would indicate that it is a pragmatic approach Dhaka can follow given its conditions. Bangladesh needs foreign investment to economically grow for which the Chinese BRI offers are attractive. And please remember, we are also very careful about the debt trap and Bangladesh is not going to fall into the debt trap uh, um, soon. And we can talk about this. I mean, if you look at Sri Lanka, um, this whole idea that Sri Lanka is in a debt trap with regard to the Chinese, if you look at the numbers, you realize that this is not really true. And I would suggest towards the end of the class, I would suggest a few literature where you can uh, you can see that uh, this 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 wrong perception which we have that um, China uh, has totally taken over uh, Sri Lanka by uh, by offering it money and and it has fallen into this debt trap. This is this really does not stand um, uh, uh, the uh, the onslaught of numbers. So. Uh, we need the money, but at the same time, it is also sensitive to India's concern because the India lot character balances geographical location and India's significant economic and security stakes, which we have already discussed. These cannot be under any circumstances, these cannot be overlooked or ignored. And anyone who does this, uh, does it at their own peril. This is something which we need to remember. So these factors have a significant influence in determining Dhaka's cautious approach towards Sino-Indian rivalry in Bangladesh. Although it appears to be India leaning, Dhaka's behavior has been more balanced, subtle and pragmatic in which Bangladesh government has zealously guarded its policy uh, making autonomy. Notwithstanding India's reservation, Dhaka has endorsed the BRI, it's very important, we have endorsed it, and welcomed Chinese loan in selective areas of the economy and in infrastructure building. Although Dhaka cancelled the Shonandia project, port building agreement with China due to pressure from 
international actors. Remember, it is not only India, but also Japan, uh, United States, uh, they were all expressed concern about, about this. Bangladesh government, it should be noted, did not hesitate to accept Chinese loans <clears throat> in several key infrastructure building projects. Okay, This includes building the largest uh, bridge in Bangladesh right now, which is the Podda Bridge, a uh, railway facility, and of course also power projects, okay? And uh, uh, railway projects within Bangladesh. Uh, also, uh, please note that Dhaka has sold 25% of stake uh, of uh, Dhaka Stock Exchange to a Chinese consortium, and you had Indian and Chinese and other companies competing for this. So again, this is something which, which tells you that um, Bangladesh's approach has been very cautious. It has been a very balancing approach. Furthermore, Dhaka has brought two submarines from China in 2017. Yes, these are old submarines, Ming-class submarine. Um, uh, and of course, the, this is not something which is going to pose a big threat to uh, to uh, uh, to powerful countries uh, in the Indian Ocean. Uh, but of course, uh, it, it tells you that uh, Bangladesh is concerned about its security. And even though the Ming submarines uh, may be old today, but it will allow Bangladesh uh, to have um, an idea about how to operate submarines. And maybe at some point when our economy and security needs um, uh, push us, we may go for uh, for better platforms, okay. So, it, uh, but this purchase, which came um, uh, in spite of New Delhi's apparent displeasure, this ultimately reflected Bangladesh's balanced approach towards the two South Asian countries. So, in managing the challenges of Sino-Indian competition, Dhaka subtly acted like a fence setter, by which it maintained a policy autonomy, uh, remained sensitive to uh, <clears throat> India's core concern selectively accepted Chinese loans and avoided the risk of falling into a debt trap. Okay, so this is something which you need to understand whenever you look at how Bangladesh has approached uh, the Sino uh, uh, Chinese, uh, sorry, the uh, Sino-Indian um, uh, competition, geoeconomic and geopolitical uh, competition in the region. So I end, ladies and gentlemen, I know I have taken a lot of time. I have totally overshoot the, the uh, time which Professor Khadga allotted to me. But as I said, Bengalis tend to talk a lot. And if you're a teacher and if you're a Bengali, you are in for trouble. So, um, but I will end with this. Uh, okay. I've talked about theory. I've talked about how Bangladesh has very adroitly, and I, I emphasize on this, that Bangladesh under the present government has been able to balance its foreign and, and security policy. Uh, it has been it's sitting on the fence, uh, trying to take advantage of, of uh, both sides um, uh, uh, and, of course, pushing Bangladesh's uh, development agenda forward. Uh, in an ideal world, ladies and gentlemen, of course, uh, we would have preferred a different world, okay? Uh, uh, and that is why I, I end with this, with, with this quotation that uh, you have uh, this South African deputation, um, uh, present day South Africa, in other words, English speaking uh, settlers, they came to London and they gave a, a, a memorandum to the, uh, to the prime minister at that time, Lord Salisbury, and this was around 1884. Lord say because this at this particular point of time they were facing problem from the Boer Republic and as you know that Boers are Dutch and German speaking settlers who ultimately settled in South Africa and and later on um, as South Africa and uh, the Boer Republic they merged together after the Boer War uh, they came to play a very important role in in South Africa so you have the whole apartheid policy and everything which which came as a result of this. But in, in the 1880s, the, the English settlers in South Africa, they were very wary of uh, the Boer Republic. They were concerned about it. They were feeling, uh, they were uncomfortable about uh, being in a neighborhood with, with, uh, with the Boer Republic. So when they came and they talked about their problem to the prime minister, the prime minister pointed out that the Germans are good neighbors. And that, that is when one of the members of the, the deputation gave this famous uh, 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 observation to the Prime Minister. He said that, my Lord, we are told that the Germans are good neighbors, but we prefer to have no neighbors at all. So I think the same also applies for a Nepali or a Bangladeshi, that uh, maybe we may have good neighbors, um, but of course, uh, in an ideal world, we would have preferred no neighbors. But the problem is that we do not live in an ideal world and we must make the best use of whatever we have. And that is why the world of international relations, the world of diplomacy is uh, so complex, so difficult, but at the same time also 
very fascinating and with that ladies and gentlemen i end my lecture please note that i have already requested professor khadga to share the slide with you so they, there is no copyright on this but uh, please note that these are the references i have used and i will be happy to share whatever literature i have on small states and foreign policy with you so you have professor khadga has my email address you can email me and i'll be happy to share them with you i particularly uh, would suggest that uh, bhumito chakma's article the bri and sino Indian geoeconomic competition in Bangladesh, coping strategy of a small state. This is a very good article which came out in IDSA's strategic analysis, a special issue on BRI. Um, it came out just uh, last year. Uh, this is something very important for understanding not only Bangladesh's policy and BRI, but also for understanding other South Asian countries, including Nepal. Uh, so I would suggest that you please try to read it. Uh, the second book is, is a classic book on uh, small states, uh, weak states in international relations. So you have a theoretical dimension and a theoretical way of looking at it. Uh, the cases of Armenia, St. Keats and Nevis, Lebanon and Cambodia. Uh, I have made tremendous use, particularly the concept which I used with regard to power, a derivative, um, uh, uh, the uh, lump of power fallacy, uh, 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 small power, uh, lump of small power, all these ideas, the theoretical portion. This was taken uh, to a great extent from this particular article, uh, Tom Long, a small state's great power, gaining influence uh, through intrinsic derivative and collective power. This came out in International Studies Review Journal, uh, which was published in 2017, volume 19. And please, please remember to read Nilanthi Samaranayaka. She's a Sri Lankan American uh, uh, analyst who works with uh, USIP, uh, United States Institute of Peace. She publishes uh, very, very good uh, uh, reports and articles on South Asia. And one such article which I've used, a report, China's engagement with smaller South Asian uh, countries, SSA, as she calls them. She doesn't call them small states. She calls them smaller South Asian countries. This was a special report, number 446, published April 2019. Uh, I would suggest you to, to read this article very carefully, this report very carefully. This will give you a very good idea. It, 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 uh, tear, it um, totally shoots down a lot of the stereotypes, the um, um, ideas which we have about China in South Asia, um, uh, particularly. It, it uh, backs up the, whatever she says with numbers, hard numbers. And uh, she has done tremendous field work um, uh, in South Asia. And this report is a reflection of that. So my suggestion, uh, my request to all of you is that uh, this is available online. I can also share it with you if you email me. Uh, so try to read her articles on a regular basis and you will get a very good idea about what is happening in South Asia. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, um, I, I end today's lecture. And I'm again very sorry for taking so much of your time. I have spoken for nearly, I think, more than two hours, two hours, two and a half hours, really. Uh, I'm very sorry for this, but I hope that um, uh, uh, this lecture made some sense, and I look forward to hearing from you. So thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor uh, Rasid. You know, uh, we are uh, really most thankful to you uh, for your extraordinarily scholastic uh, comprehensive lectures. Uh, there is no questions of time because this is the weekend. And uh, what you uh, share with you uh, theoretically and in the meantime prescribing some down-to-earth uh, foreign policy uh, ideas or uh, like uh, paradigms of, the, of Bangladesh uh, of survival of small country and prosperity of small country that are really much like useful for Nepal so it's really down to earth, like uh, we, we sometimes uh, be a bit more emotional while uh, dealing with our neighbors. So that we have, we could learn from this morning lectures. Uh, there is no question of time, you know, it has been proven that the Bengali has a sharp brain, you know, so that 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 could make really uh, outstanding performance. So there is, there is uh, I appreciate your, your performance and your scholastic presentation. So I uh, would like to request uh, uh, Major General Himalay Thapa uh, and Gaurav Bhattrai. Uh, Himalay sir and Gaurav Bhattrai, uh, two of our uh, Major General retired Himalay Thapa who has been uh, teaching small state security in, in fourth semester of MA uh, in our department for last four years. 
and uh, also he has been he worked with the army for 30 plus eight year, years so after listening professor rasid uh, uh, do you have any uh, observation on his uh, his like comprehensive lectures and followed by just one or two minutes uh, observation by Gaurav Bhattray. He also shared the same course with Himalayas or stuff. So, and then I will open the floor. And then at the end, I will request uh, Ambassador Kaganath Adhikari, sir, will we'll, uh, express a word of thanks with a few words. Uh, uh, thank you, thank you, sir. Thank you very much, Khadka, sir. Uh, Professor Rasid, really uh, thought provoking and uh, enlightening presentation because uh, uh, we have been also teaching uh, security of small states uh, and how like, uh, you know, small states are gripped by small state syndrome. Uh, but, uh, you know, I agree with you that it's a matter of perception, like the way we view the countries as small, weak, you know, fragile, strong, powerful and powerless. And this binary oppositions, that, that, that themselves a matter of perception. But my question uh, to you, Professor, after listening to your such a profound lecture uh, is, you know, owing to the geostrategic uh, competition between uh, the two Asian giants and even the recent border problems that we have witnessed, uh, you know, if we try to compare the foreign policy strategies or never exactly speaking, never foreign policy of India and China, uh, what are the larger repercussions on the small state security in South Asia? Yes, I mean, I understand, as I said, I mean, um, that given the fact that um, we live in a very difficult neighborhood. And of course, as I said, historically, India's uh, security policy, which is again, um, which has been taken from the Mughals and from, uh, from the British. Um, oh, sir, could, you, could you take your bi microphone closer? Okay, sorry. So, uh, so uh, given, the, uh, given what I have discussed so far, um, South Asia's challenge is, is manifold, and particularly given the fact that you have a China and India which are becoming very, very nationalist. And this is again something which you need to take into consideration that this is a, this, uh, both in India and China, you're going to see foreign policies where nationalism is going to come and play an increasingly important role in the days ahead. Uh, so often diplomats, uh, even military officers, they will, the foreign policy establishment, in other words, they will often find very little room for maneuver when you have a nationalist upsurge or a nationalist wave uh, uh, all through the country uh, to, to, uh, to deal with the problem. In fact, if you look at what has happened in, in Leh right now, um, you notice that how China and India, yes, there has been a conflict, but on the Chinese side, um, uh, this whole refusal to come up with, uh, with the number of casualties uh, which the Chinese uh, have suffered, number one. Number two, the emphasis that uh, we want to deal with this in a diplomatic manner, the, uh, the release of Indian uh, troops which were in Chinese custody. That tells you that this is something which both the parties wish to, yes, the problem is there. It is not going to go away. It's an undemarcated territory. So it has implications. Uh, and of course, it, there's a historical legacy also, which is there, which Nepal also faces right now. But at the same time, uh, there are diplomatic ways of dealing with it. But the fear is that the way nationalism has swept through India, through China, and also in other parts of the world, it may become difficult for countries to ultimately proceed um, and implement their uh, uh, strategy or good diplomacy in the area. So that is a problem for us. And this needs to be taken into consideration. Number two, with regard to Nepal, Bangladesh, or the smaller South Asian countries. Um, I think for us, it will not be wise under any circumstances to embrace any particular party. And, and this is again something it applies to, to all countries all over the world. The most important thing is that we need to look after our, our national interests. And that is why I particularly talked about Bangladesh's foreign policy and the Awami League government, which I think is a, is a textbook example particularly under the Prime Minister, uh, Sheikh Hasina, it is, I, I think, a textbook example of how to be a balancer, or at least how to at least ensure that you get the best out of both the worlds. But it is a very delicate act, and it is not always possible for everyone to formulate a policy in this manner, because you have to take so many imponderables into consideration. So my fear is that whether Bangladesh can 
continue with this policy in the long run? That remains to be seen. Right now, it has worked. It has worked for the last 10 years also. But what are the challenges in the days ahead? Whether Bangladesh can continue with this policy, that is something which remains to be seen. So there is this danger for us. And, and, uh, and uh, each and every country, we have our own realities. And remember, these realities are not only external realities. Internal realities also have to be taken into consideration. So the problem of formulating foreign policy, particularly in a world which is so flux, um, you have uh, traditional uh, uh, challenges, you have military, you have uh, diplomacy, uh, diplomatic challenges, but at the same time, you also have growing environmental concerns, uh, uh, growing quote-unquote non-traditional security issues. They are playing a more and more important role. Uh, how to balance them? This is a challenge. So to answer your question that whether there is a formula, whether I can clearly tell you that, yes, we can do this and others will fall into place, it is not so. And I think that, is, that was the main thrust of my, of my lecture. I, I tried to show you that one thing that do not think of small states as powerless. We have power. But how to use that, that is the work of the diplomat. This is something which is very, very important. The population, and, and uh, I, I'm talking about national power. It is not only the diplomat, the politicians, the military, um, uh, the uh, people in the economic sector, the general population, they all have to figure out how we are going to proceed with uh, uh, a policy which will ultimately serve Nepal or Bangladesh's interest. And that is why, again, I suggested that please read Djibouti's foreign policy. I know when I give the example of Djibouti, a lot of people become very unhappy. In Dhaka, when I gave the example of Djibouti, a lot of people took offense. They say that, how can you compare Bangladesh with Djibouti? But my emphasis was that it is not a question of size. It is a question of the realities. Djibouti faces the same reality a country like Nepal or Bangladesh faces. You have the same um, uh, asymmetry in power. You have tremendously powerful neighbor economically and militarily many, many times powerful than you. But at the same time, here is a country which has been able to, in spite of the geopolitical game being played out in the Horn of Africa region, it has been able to pursue a policy which has brought benefit. It has brought basis. I'm not talking about having Nepal or Bangladesh having basis. And that is a very dangerous thing for us to do. But I'm saying that look at how Djibouti has played its foreign policy card and it has been able to survive in a very difficult world. This is something which needs to be taken into consideration. So there are lessons which we can draw. But of course, each and every country, we have our own realities, and those realities must be taken into consideration whenever we go about formulating our policies. Thank you so much. Thaba uh, Aymale, Thaba, sir. Please, sir, over to you. Yes, uh, first of all, good morning. and. Uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Zaman, for your very insightful and very candid uh, uh, lecture. Thank you, uh, I, I hope that uh, our students and uh, myself personally, I, I, uh, I enriched uh, my uh, intellectual uh, capacity through your, uh, uh, through your lecture. Uh, in fact, uh, what I want to ask you is, like, uh, I hope you, you must be knowing uh, the present situation, the present crisis, the power crisis that the Nepal is facing. So uh, what do you think um, are the steps that uh, uh, Nepal can take in resolving or in uh, diffusing uh, this uh, very critical uh, core national security issue? And I'm very much uh, impressed uh, by the comparison or the, the stance or the policies taken by Bangladesh in balancing India and China. Thank you. Yes, so in fact, I mean, uh, I have been looking at the uh, uh, studying the Nepal uh, issue, and uh, I know that it is, it is a very difficult uh, uh, phase of uh, Nepal uh, India relations. Um, my my take on this is that um, yes, diplomacy has to play a very important role in this uh, because otherwise it is not uh, an option. Uh, I, I don't think it is feasible. Uh, certainly not feasible for Nepal, and also certainly not feasible for India. Um, to continue with an aggressive policy. Um, it has to take the Nepali people on board. It has to take, uh, because when I see that your parliament has passed a bill, uh, the new map, in, in, and I think it was a unanimous vote, if I'm not mistaken. Okay, uh, correct me if I'm wrong. I think it was a unanimous vote. So you, that tells you that 
uh, if the parliament reflects the will of the people, this will has been reflected. So you cannot formulate a policy from the Indian side, uh, which will totally disregard the feeling of the Nepali people. Yes, Nepal may have disadvantages, but it also has advantages. It is a country, and as you have shown in the last few years, I think, and the way in the, uh, Nepal's foreign policy has been, um, uh, uh, I would say that it has, it has looked at other options. Um, it has made its policy much more pragmatic. Uh, that I think has, uh, it, it should tell people in responsible places that one should not take any uh, country, uh, take any country for granted. And, and one needs to formulate one's policy accordingly. So that goes for uh, 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 the other party. But my worry is, sir, that, uh, my worry is, sir, that, again, as I pointed out, the, the nationalist fervor, which is, uh, uh, which has taken over South Asia, uh, particularly in India, I see this uh, in, a, in a big way. And also, uh, to some extent, the reflection of that when you have uh, nationalism sweeping a particular country, nationalism looks for uh, the other, and the other often is in, in, in countries around you. So whether it is Bangladeshi immigrants um, in Assam, whether it is Nepalese, and becoming close to China, for example, or, or acting in a uh, quote-unquote aggressive manner, for example, or Sri Lankans or Maldivians, uh, that is there. And the worry is that in, in a world where populism, nationalism, uh, these become the normal uh, reality, then, of course, I think it becomes very difficult to have uh, agreements. And this is something which needs to be taken into consideration. So my worry for South Asia is that we are becoming or we are entering into very uh, dangerous phases. Um, and this phase is a phase where often uh, reasonable uh, policies uh, uh, may often become lost um, uh, because of, of the uh, clamor uh, which is coming uh, because we have unleashed the, uh, the demons of nationalism. Uh, so for Nepal and um, India, uh, definitely challenging um, situation in the days ahead. But of course, Nepal, I think, has proven um, and this is very, very important, that it is a country which cannot be pushed. And I'm sure that policy planners all over South Asia, they have taken this into cognizance. I can speak personally from Bangladesh that the way Nepal has been um, uh, pursuing its policy, uh, when one reads the newspapers, when one reads the comments, particularly in uh, e-copy of a newspaper, uh, you can feel the pulse of the people and you can feel that um, uh, with, without un, often with not going into the full technical details of of uh, the uh, the ongoing uh, 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 standoff between Nepal and and Bangladesh uh, uh, India, but still uh, the people of Bangladesh at least they feel that yes Nepal has taken a position, and I'm sure also the Nepalese feel in the same way. I'm sure also others have taken this into cognizance, and hopefully this will play out positively for Nepal uh, in the negotiations which are bound to follow uh, uh, this, this particular situation. And of course, I would also suggest that um, I feel that given what has happened in Leh, uh, uh, this again puts uh, uh, more emphasis on negotiation, taking neighbors uh, on board before formulating any policy. Uh, this is something which a reasonable foreign policy establishment, security establishment would do uh, under the circumstances in, instead of going for uh, um, um, uh, confrontational postures. Thank you, Professor. Thank, Thank you, Professor. Thank you, Professor. Uh, Thank you very much. Now, uh, well, uh, while listening, Professor Rasid, uh, I think uh, if we had uh, scheduled for a, for a day long seminar would be would be really like beneficial for us um, because every jargons terminology concept discourses theories and policy like framework of Bangladesh uh, what he has shared with us are really most beneficial for not only for academic uh, usage for us but also for Nepal's foreign po policy framing as well. Uh, we, we are not the foreign policy framework, however, but 
even like you know in an academic discourse what we could learn from him is, a, is a really a, uh, I don't have uh, words to uh, express my thankfulness to Professor uh, Rashid. So now uh, let me take a couple of questions. Uh, in the first round, uh, if any uh, master's, PhD student and any scholars uh, wants to ask uh, three questions at a time and make a very brief uh, introduction and one, one straight line, and then uh, Professor Rashid will uh, may be able to answer three questions at a time very briefly. And uh, if there will be another round, I will ask another round. The first round, uh, any anyone can, Matrika Paurel and any 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 others. Uh, okay, Matrika Paurel, a PhD student. And is there anyone else, except Matrika in first round? Okay, Matrika ji, you can start now. Uh, namaskar, uh, my dear Guru, and Namaskar, uh, Professor Rashid, all the way from Bangladesh. And um, we are honored uh, to have you and to um, get your valued information on uh, my subject. Uh, I have uh, one question so far, and I have written down. Uh, the uh, is the sound is okay, uh, yes, Professor Rashid? Okay. Yes, I can hear you. The, the existing political structures and institutional settings of small states are uh, their resident evil. Um, and the small states in the past, um, like Singapore, Malaysia, South uh, um, Korea, and many others uh, in different parts of the world have uh, uh, earned uh, their socio-economic development uh, through the radical adoption of novel uh, state mechanism and institutional frameworks. But the small states in our part of the world, especially South Asia and Southeast Asia, are doing nothing, not inventing the policies and institutions and political frameworks um, uh, on the basis of our ground reality. But instead, we are borrowing from uh, the development uh, saga and the gospel of democracy and institutional advancement from uh, Scandinavia and from uh, uh, the Western Hemisphere, from uh, Northern America and other parts of the world. So can't we uh, uh, just invent our own or the discourse must focus on the invention of our genuine uh, uh, institutions? You know, actually the, the failure of institutional uh, consolidation, uh, Nepal and uh, Bangladesh, uh, you know, um, are suffering, the countries like uh, us are suffering uh, and then we are doing nothing but uh, making a far cry uh, for any kind of success. That's my question. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Yeah. So shall I answer now, Professor Khadka, or uh, shall we take more questions? Okay, let me answer this. Um, you're right, uh, um, and, and thank you so much for, for welcoming me. Um, the, the whole issue of uh, whether Western models apply to uh, other parts of the world, this has been an ongoing debate. Uh, but, uh, and of course, this whole issue, I think it has been very clearly um, uh, proven uh, that uh, it has been very clearly proved that uh, one size does not fit all. So what has worked uh, for even um, in the Western world does not automatically apply to other Western countries. Um, I would particularly suggest uh, you to read uh, Francis Fukuyama's two volumes on political order. Uh, the, I think this is, these are two great volumes which ultimately shows that how uh, uh, governance models which works in one part of the world does not work in another part of the world. What has worked in England did not work in France and what worked in France certainly did not work in Central Europe or in East Europe. Recently, uh, uh, another book, Why uh, 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 the Narrow Corridor. This is again another book which I would suggest you to read. Particularly, this is very important for, uh, for the question which you have raised that how do countries like uh, South Asian countries and, and African countries, for example, or even Latin American countries, for example, where you have this concept of uh, Leviathan, um, which is the state, but uh, what type of Leviathan is this? Is it a strong, a powerful country or is it a uh, 
uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, a Leviathan, which is which makes a lot of noise, but ultimately is not able to deliver. So these questions uh, are ongoing, and I think the consensus is that it is not possible for any country to take a model from country X, even for example, even if it is an Asian model, whether it is a South Korean model, for example, the South Korean model will not work for Bangladesh because South Korea's colonial past, what the Americans did in South Korea, um, how capital was uh, accumulated and the development policies which were pursued under the American uh, uh, security umbrella in South Korea, this doesn't apply, this cannot work for a country like Bangladesh, for example, okay? So the South Korean model of development uh, for Bangladesh for Nepal will not work. But what can work is, again, what I tried to show into this lecture, that certain theoretical models may be helpful, but those theoretical models certainly have to take local realities into consideration. Okay, otherwise, they're bound to fail. And, and I think this has been more or less the consensus across the world right now, whether it is development practitioner or development theoretician or political scientist, um, uh, more or less everyone has, has uh, reached this conclusion. And I think the narrow corridor again rams home uh, this lesson. So uh, I, I suggestion to all the students who are listening here, particularly those who are interested in, in uh, political theory, try to read the, uh, in fact, again, I have an e-copy of this. I shouldn't be saying this online, but of course illegally downloaded. Um, if you are interested, I can share this with you. And um, uh, particularly, I would ask you to read uh, the section on, on um, uh, state formation in South Asia. Uh, very, very important, very uh, applicable to for understanding what is going on in, in our part of the world. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Very Thank much. you, Professor. Well, uh, we do have some faculty and, and uh, first pass and second pass PhD student and MA student in the yeah, meantime. I have one uh, there are some uh, PhD students from all the department, Central Department of Rural Development. They also are taking a, a half like, you know, credit course on foreign policy and diplomacy relation related. So uh, we know uh, Timil Sena from Chiton, his uh, room is uh, with full of fan, uh, probably might be hot there in Chiton. And any uh, anyone like uh, Sota, uh, Dr. Basal, if you want to uh, ask questions, be prepared. And now, Binod, please, over to you. Yes, sir. Good morning. Either, good morning, sir. And good morning first, to all. Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, are you hearing me? Yes, yes, I Go can ahead. hear you. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, I would like to ask a question about uh, small states. Is there any particular example that the asymmetric dependency has changed into the symmetric dependency by any particular small states in interrelation. Can you get some example? Can you provide this? Uh, a small yeah. state which has become uh, very powerful. Those, uh, uh, let, let me describe. Uh, usually, Nepal is in this present uh, scenario, usually dependent in Indian, uh, um, uh, so what to say, economic condition, uh, relationships and so forth. Which and everything are usually dependent upon India. Yes, mm. that means our dependency is asymmetric. And uh, how can we convert it into the symmetric dependency, such that it, it, it can, yes. uh, can develop <laughs> itself? And is, is there any example of such kind of uh, example? Uh, sir, what I tried to uh, in fact discuss over the last two hours is exactly the question which you have posed that um, most of the small states they suffer from what is this what you call is this asymmetry in, in relationship and in fact i also pointed out uh, this in my lecture that we suffer from asymmetry of power um, so it is an asymmetrical relationship but the important thing is that and, and that is why i tried to provide you with examples of countries which have used uh, their diplomatic and other means to carve out a space for themselves. Now, if you look at a country like, I mean, Singapore is a different example because often we feel that Singapore, okay, it has, it's a very different ballgame. But if you look at a country like Israel, an existential crisis country, okay, surrounded by Arab countries, it, it emerged out of really nothing but it has been able to now become the most powerful country uh, within the region, uh, even within the world. So that is a good example. But of course, in this particular case, 
United States played a very important role over there. Okay, so whether we can take this example as again a size which fits all, certainly not. Singapore, again, the reality is very different. Singapore's geographical location, um, the Cold War, um, even the political elites, they played a very important role in transforming Singapore into something which is very different. So uh, the asymmetry has taken place. It has become a symmetrical power. I would ask you to look at a country like Cuba. If you look at Cuba's reality um, and how Cuba has been able to survive in the post-Cold War period, not when Soviet Union is supporting it, okay, how it has been able to survive and, and uh, proceed in the, in the post-Cold War period, this is again something which needs to be uh, taken into consideration. And this can also apply even for a country like Bangladesh. I mean, my argument is that we cannot it is very difficult for us to uh, to identify countries which have totally transformed themselves. There may be one or two successes, but most of the time it is an ongoing thing. It, this is something because there are certain limitations on our part. This we cannot change. Okay, I talked about Morganthu. Morganthu's uh, uh, criteria cannot be totally discredited in today's world, but I am saying that on top of that, we have to take other issues also into consideration. So when I talk about power of small states, I'm not totally saying that we are totally going to forget realism. No, that is not possible. But I'm also saying realism plus other issues needs to be taken into consideration and only then can we proceed. But if you to simply adhere to realism, then we are not going to go anywhere because the then we are always going to be uh, in the back bench. That is never, it, we, are, we, we can never say, have a voice or say anything. But in today's world, we see that through adroit use, through wise use of different facets of power, countries are able to push their agenda forward. They've been able to come forward. That is why I gave the example of Estonia, for example, uh, or the Baltic states, for example. This doesn't change their reality vis-a-vis -vis Russia. This doesn't change that they face a big threat as far as Russia is concerned or uh, other European countries are concerned. But how do they make the best of a very difficult situation? This is something which needs to be taken into consideration. So to answer your question at one, I would say that it is very difficult uh, uh, to identify a country which has totally changed its power. Uh, the examples would be uh, Israel, it would be Singapore. But then again, these examples are uh, examples which cannot be emulated by most of the countries of the world. These are totally context driven. Okay, uh, Israel because of its close ties with the United States. Again, Singapore because of a few factors which cannot be emulated by everyone. But other countries all over the world, small states, today are able to make best use of other facets of power, and they have been able to derive benefit for themselves. And it is an ongoing process. So no permanent answer, but uh, an answer which, which you have to uh, uh, work for every day. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, uh, thank you, Professor. Thank you very much. And thank you, Binod, uh, for asking questions. The last round, uh, uh, maybe I have to uh, encourage uh, more from PhD students. Uh, anything? Any questions from uh, Manish? Okay, Manish, go ahead, and I request Sanjay Jang Raimaji uh, from PhD. Next round, uh, the last last round of questions. Manish, go ahead. Thank you, sir. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you, Professor Dr. Rashid Jaman, for his so insightful and eloquent uh, lecture. So I have a question about the South Asian small states in the post-COVID world, actually. So we are all aware about the economic devastation and talking about the collective power of the South Asian small states, we have regional institutions uh, such as SARC and BIMSTEC. So what mm -hmm. would be the better option for small states uh, towards regionalism in the post-COVID world for their economic uh, uprise? And if we do not uh, go towards the, uh, this uh, regional integration or so regional cooperation, we, we would be, I think, limited towards the bilateral dialogue only with the China. So what do you think about this, Professor? No, it's very interesting. In fact, uh, the post, uh, I mean, we are living in the world of the pandemic right now. And it again tells you, as I pointed out in my lecture, that it again tells you that our traditional understanding of international relations, uh, this is often inadequate. Um, you simply cannot think of military security in a world where your biggest threat is a germ. And that has uh, lain all the mighty, powerful countries uh, down. Um, and it also has 
created problems for us um, uh, because of our um, uh, often uh, our infrastructure is, is not adequate. In fact, very few infrastructure in the world has proven to be adequate uh, for facing such a uh, such a uh, problem. And of course, the issue of uh, uh, cooperation in South Asia this has again been an ongoing uh, thing. People have been crying about it. People have cri cried themselves hoarse, in fact, about it. Um, this is a country. Uh, this is a region where more than any other region, I think regionalism is, is required, but regionalism simply hasn't worked out. And the reason for that is, of course, the power configuration. Uh, the power asymmetry in South Asia is such that it is very, very difficult um, uh, to, for regionalism to proceed until and unless uh, I think that the most powerful country in this particular case, India, uh, takes an initiative forward. Uh, and But often this has not been the case. Unfortunately, I often feel that uh, there is this saying by Henry Kissinger where he says that, look, uh, to dominate, uh, you have need power. But to have a consensus, to have, provide leadership, you must have consensus. And often that is missing in, in South Asia. In South Asia, uh, we often see the tendency to dominate, which is, of course, dependent on, on stark power. But if you are going to become a responsible country uh, in the 21st century, um, uh, and of course, uh, you think of uh, yourself as a responsible country, you want the world to honor you as a responsible country, to take you on board as a responsible country in the G20 meetings, for example, then of course, you must provide leadership in South Asia. And that leadership has to be based on consensus. And I think in South Asia, that is missing. That is missing on all, on, on all sides, in fact. It is not only a, a problem, because remember, uh, I feel with Nepal, I feel with Bangladesh as a, as a Nepali or a Bangladeshi, I often feel that, yes, this power asymmetry is something which is the root of all problems. But in fact, we also at times are responsible for what has happened in South Asia. So it takes two to tango. It also takes two to make regionalism successful. Um, uh, in a similar fashion, uh, if, if for South Asia, I would I would say that uh, all the countries of South Asia need to understand that this is something which is important for them. Uh, WHO has been constantly telling us that look, it is not possible for a single country to deal with the problem, and you are going to face such problems more in the days ahead. In fact, I got a question from one of your classmates asking that how do you deal with climate change and food security, because this is going to, these are going to be the challenges in the days ahead. I'll give you another example why we need cooperative venture in South Asia. You look at climate change and the implication, implication is that the Himalayan glaciers are going to melt or they are going to recede, which means that Nepal is going to face a problem, which means that water is going to flow down the South Asian rivers, which means a downstream country like Bangladesh is going to face floods maybe for 15, 20 years because you have the ice, uh, uh, you have the glaciers melting. But then after 20, 25 years or in 50 years time, this entire region is going to face water scarcity. So how do you deal with this? How do you deal with a problem which cannot be solved within a boundary? within a political boundary. So Bangladesh, Nepal, uh, India, and even China has to be taken into consideration. You are going to deal with the problem of the waters of the Brahmaputra because China is going to face water scarcity. It has already started working on the waters of the Brahmaputra. If Brahmaputra's water is taken away to feed, the, uh, to quench the thirst of North China, then that is going to have an impact for Nepal, Bangladesh, Tibet, South Asia, even Myanmar for that matter. Not only because of water scarcity, but because of desertification, because of food insecurity, you're going to have population movement. These are problems which we need to remember. I, I know I may sound often very theoretical uh, and also maybe very non-traditionally security nature, but please remember one thing. Professor Khadga will tell you, my, ex, my study throughout my entire professional life has been on the military. So more than any other individual over here, I think, other than the military officers uh, who are here, um, I work with the military, I study the military, I deal with traditional security issues. But increasingly, I have come to feel that given South Asia's reality, uh, maybe the uh, COVID-19 has made it more clear, but given what is happening in the world of um, uh, climate change, given what is happening in the world of food security, population movement, without South Asian countries coming together and working jointly on these problems, 
it will not be possible for us to go forward. And we will realize it at, at some point of time. I think the post-COVID, uh, the COVID-19 situation is a sort of a wake-up call for us. But if we do not listen to this alarm, we are going to face bigger dangers in the days ahead. And, and that is why I actively feel that uh, we need to seriously think about cooperation in South Asia. But as I said, that cooperation requires consensus. Only then can leadership emerge. Simple dominance will not bring about cooperation. And, and it will lead to more, more heartburn and it will lead to more nationalist outpourings, which is not beneficial for anyone in the long run. Thank you. Thank you once again, Professor Rasid. And question for Manish. Uh, if there are uh, any questions, one more question I can entertain. Otherwise, I will take uh, three, four minutes and request uh, Ambassador Khanna for the guy. Oh, Sanjay ji, are yes, you sir. making questions? Okay, yes, sir. I have one question. Okay. Hello? Yes, I can hear you. Good morning, yeah, you Professor Rashid. Uh, okay. Okay. Sorry, okay. Uh, uh, I will just like uh, one minute. Okay. Go ahead. Go ahead, please. Sir, th uh, please, uh, Sanjay, thank you. Please. Thank you. Thank you very much for the outstanding uh, presentation. And you mentioned somewhere about Israel lobby in US foreign policy and how a small state can influence the foreign policy of a bigger nation, Israel lobby in US foreign policy. But Israel uh, have a diaspora IPAC, American Israel Public Affairs Committee, which has a, a budget of billions of dollars in a fiscal year. So how do you see the role of diaspora because other small nations doesn't have a strong diaspora in a bigger nation or bigger countries. But Israel has IPAC, is a huge amount of influence on IPAC. So how do you see this, sir, in the context of other nations? It's a, it's a great question, really. Um, true, uh, the Israeli diaspora, uh, not only the diaspora, but also you have a very powerful Jewish community within the United States. Uh, in fact, that is also being played out by the Indian community right now. Um, extremely mobile. A very successful community, which has which is emerging as a very powerful lobby within United States, and not only do you have lobbies, but you also have Indian-born or uh, uh, Jewish or Greek or um, um, uh, other politicians of different uh, uh, ethnic background uh, playing an important role in American politics. This is bound to happen in a country like America because it's a land of immigrants. Uh, but the the thing is that. In today's globalized world, you have migrants moving to all parts of the world. So will it be near impossible for other migrant communities to organize themselves? Let me give you an example. Let me ask this question to you. We have millions of Bangladeshis out there. Bangladeshis who are in uh, countries like the Middle East, who are in countries like Malaysia, for example, Singapore, but we have a huge number of people in United States and in United Kingdom and in Europe also today. Italy is also a big uh, destination uh, is a, uh, for Bangladeshi migrants. For us, mostly for the last 40 years, Bangladeshis have been going there. Their voices have not been heard by anyone. Today, when I look at Bangladeshis becoming involved in New York's politics, in Florida's politics, in California's politics, I realize that in 40 years time, the first generation of Bangladeshis may have worked uh, as taxi drivers or in some other odd jobs, but their sons and daughters have lived the American dream. They have got educated. They have made themselves now a part of the American landscape uh, or the British landscape for that matter, and gradually they're entering into politics. So when you see someone like Preeti Patel or Sajid Khan or uh, the, the gentleman who was, Javed Khan, for example, I think I can get his name wrong, in United Kingdom, for example, all sons and daughters of immigrants, but they have gradually established themselves. So if you tell me that there is no Nepali diaspora uh, all over the world, it is very difficult for me to believe that, or a Bangladeshi diaspora, or a Vietnamese diaspora. What has happened is, in fact, let me give you another example. The most successful diaspora community right now in the United States, can you tell me which community is that? Uh, Professor Sanjay, can you tell me? I'll, I'll tell you. It is the Nigerian community. 
Now that is a surprise. Okay, we would think that, okay, maybe it is somewhat different. The Nigerian community is today seen as one of the most successful diaspora community in United States. And this is bound to have an impact on US-Nigeria relationship, US policy towards Africa. It is a matter of time. Today, tomorrow, day after tomorrow, these changes are going to take place. So when Chawan Lai said that it is too early to talk about the impact of the French Revolution in a similar fashion, 40 years, 45 years for Bangladesh, uh, it has been independent since 1971. This is a long time for a, for a person like me. But in the uh, if you take history into consideration, this has not been a long time. But we can see how this Bangladeshi diaspora is now changing is having an impact or going to have an impact on US policy or British policy towards Bangladesh. So in a similar fashion, the Jewish community has been very successful. The Israel lobby certainly is very powerful, but other diaspora communities, because of the nature of the American political system, the, it's a migrant country. So these communities will eventually make their presence well, but it requires certain other things. It requires education. It requires economic power. It requires the ability to influence politicians because it is not only lobbies. It is also your local congressman or senator who is going to have a role. How will you pressure them? How will you influence their policy? That is something which these communities need to figure them, themselves out. But I believe that today or tomorrow, within the next few years, we are going to see, for Bangladesh, we are already seeing this, the Bangladeshi diaspora in Europe, the Bangladeshi diaspora in the United States, they are going to have an impact upon Bangladesh's relationship with, U with USA. The same also goes for, uh, for Nepal also. So the Israeli lobby certainly is an exception. Not everyone can emulate this. Um, often it is not possible. And also because of, of ground realities, America is a Judeo-Christian state. Ladies and gentlemen, please remember this. It is not a Christian state. It is a Judeo-Christian state. It has long roots. Uh, the ties with Israel, uh, they go way back. The whole concept of Anglo-Israelism, this needs to be taken into consideration. But still, other countries, I believe, other diaspora community, I believe, are gradually going to make their presence felt within the American political system because the nature of the political system is such. And definitely, these are going to be reflected in America's policy towards different parts of the world. Thank you, sir. Well, thank, uh, you, thank you, everyone, those who raised the questions uh, and, and uh, uh, curiosity. Well, while I could like, uh, I could uh, make like this session more uh, more productive uh, though it has uh, tremendously uh, become uh, productive session and uh, what i could uh, i can conclude in very uh, briefly that uh, bangladesh uh, and what like professor rashid has uh, concluded uh, while responding uh, sanjay ji and professor rashid uh, i know uh, you are uh, you have expertise in a strategic study, so that there are some military officer in our student like you know side and a faculty side as well, and hopefully uh, we are just starting to have a national defense university, and you will be one of the like you know external research person once the university will be established hopefully, been and because you you are studying on that uh, areas, well, uh, Bangladesh uh, the colonial legacy. Uh, what we talk about Nigeria, what you talk about uh, Kenya, Ghana, any African, any African like British uh, colonial uh, African country, because of their uh, their colonial past, and for example, even in Bangladesh, you did establish Dhaka University in 100 years ago. Yeah. So we established some 60 years ago in Nepal. So that has been a plus minus. Of course, uh, we don't feel bad that we were not colonized. You know, We are proud of being a non-colonized uh, oldest national state in South Asia. However, uh, in, in intellectual history, modern intellectual history and diaspora, uh, human capital, what you could send people even during the colonial era were because of your colonial legacy. And intellectual history, what you could form back in home, even after those you you were you uh, your independence was was quite late, uh, somewhere around my 
uh, like you know years of birth birth so that that even like uh, taking opportunity of your colonial past and uh, you could you could form intellectual history very rapidly so r and d research and development and then diaspora knowledge transfer that could make uh, so far as i have known you have a lot of think tanks in dhaka and your think tanks are really much robust compared to us because of that what you could bring out what you, you share with us about the down to earth policy how ba how bangladesh should balance between china and india so only the politician as you also share that bangabandhu sheikh mujibur rahman and then his daughter uh, sheikh hasina was it uh, of course they are closer to delhi and of course uh, khalida jaya uh, she was not similarly similar like rapport with delhi so there might be uh, some like you know pro and uh, cons of even within the politician in a small state like sri lanka bangladesh and nepal even in sri lanka raja pakse versus sri sena wa was there and even today so for that having this paradoxical political development and in the meantime you did have a long time like military junta in 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 70s and 80s after sheik uh, bangabandhu was assassinated in uh, 70s so despite this paradoxical like political upheavals in your country but you you did develop intellectual history and you had a diaspora so that because of that like uh, you could develop the institution think tanks research so that somehow of course politician in our part of the world not only in nepal of course not only in bangladesh uh, in south asia in africa in latin america in developing world even in the united states of america donald trump has been hiring and firing national security advisor in in a month and weeks so so that that is the overall nature of politician everywhere in the world they they assume that they know everything else however at least you do have a better institution so that that largely has been assisting to frame your foreign policy so that you are balancing you are drawing 25 billion dollars from china no matter whether you are directly adjoining with china china is not is not your first neighbor your second neighbor probably however you you drew that most amount for your infrastructure development and in the meantime you are having very comfortable diplomatic security relationship with india your your like you know traditional uh, uh, like uh, partners so that we should learn from bangladesh while listening you this morning for us of course we are not the policy makers uh, we are just trying to produce uh, university graduates to those who could contribute in the days to come in in policy making and policy framing and policy implementation so that is a very useful lectures this morning we we did we did have with uh, uh, professor rashid uh, so those like you know books uh, those uh, slides what you share with us are really must beneficial i i have shared uh, this link to some of the policy makers as well but as i already uh, already like a uh, share in my background policy makers they don't they don't assume that there are something they have to learn they 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 assume that they know everything else so that probably uh, they they didn't like you know so they're interest to join with us so that that's not our big uh, concern because uh, it's it's basically academic discourse so i on behalf of department and myself uh, really most thankful to professor rashid uzman who is a really Uh, uh academic uh, scholastic like you know sheer academic and scholastic idea with us this morning and with some pragmatic prescription for a small state survival and prosperity so our like uh, partnership in academic uh, domain will be continue this is just the departure point so i will keep requesting professor rashid to supervise to ex uh, examine the phd dissertation and also Uh, professor rashid has already requested me to do the same uh, so we'll we'll have us sometime soon a kind of phd dissertation bhaiwa from his university 
So thank you very much once again, uh, Professor Rasid. And I request uh, Ambassador Khaganath Adhikari, who is now a faculty in our department. Uh, would you please uh, speak up a minute plus and then express vote of thanks on behalf of the department. Khaganath, sir, please, okay. sir. Okay. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'll just turning my video on. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, first of all, let me, uh, on my behalf and on behalf of the Department of International Relations and Diplomacy, very warmly welcome uh, uh, Dr. Rashid Jaman from Dhaka University. Uh, I listened to the whole lecture. It was really very uh, useful. And I also noticed that uh, among the participants include faculty members from the Truven University, not only the Department of International Relations and Diplomacy, but from other departments also. I saw uh, Professor Urbakarki also, and there were others. And I, I assume that there were a few from, uh, hopefully, Bangladesh. Uh, just uh, looking at the names, I thought some of them might be from Bangladesh also. Over this uh, technology has made things just very much easy uh, with some complications as well. Uh, and there were many uh, students, PhD students, master students from the uh, Truven University Department of International Relations and Diplomacy. Uh, I am here just to propose a vote of thanks uh, to Professor Jaman and the other participants. Uh, first of all, I thank all the participants for their participation. And I at time noticed uh, there were around 60 participants to now there are only 36. Maybe we took a long time. Uh, I am really very much impressed by uh, the eloquence of Professor Zaman speaking about more than two and a half hours of what we, we, we are spending about three hours now. And just non-stop speaking more than two hours is not an easy job. I take class myself and I have that kind of experience how difficult it is to keep speaking and speaking and speaking. Uh, you must be very tired and still you, know, you took uh, that effort, you took the time, you spared that time. Uh, we are really uh, grateful on behalf of the department. We are grateful to you, Professor Jaman. Uh, I really appreciate I haven't. I'm not very new to this profession. I was by profession a diplomat. I joined it uh, just uh, about one year ago. And I have seen that Professor Kharga Kesi, the head of department of DIRD, uh, has been tirelessly working uh, to organize such kind of seminars, webinars, seminars, whatever you may call it. They are really very useful. Uh, and I know how hard he is working to make them successful. Uh, it gives us all, in, uh, the faculty members and students, a very good exposure uh, with the uh, topic, with other areas also. And this morning, Professor Jaman, you very well spoke about uh, small states. Uh, and uh, you can just uh, visit the chat box. And there were very, very appreciative comments. I, I, I saw Professor Kaurakeshi himself just mentioning it's a very eloquent lecture. And I noticed um, Professor Dhurvacharki saying impressive, impressive and uh, relevant lecture. And there were others just simply wow and very, very useful, etc. And this is very useful, especially in the sense that um, uh, one of our faculty members just mentioned that uh, this our course, master's course, we teach uh, this is small states. Uh, and we being small states, and I don't know whether Nepal, Bangladesh should be uh, categorized as a small state. You very eloquently mentioned about it. Uh, it is also a matter of, there are certain uh, quantitative, qualitative criteria, but it is, uh, it is also a matter of perception. At least in Nepal, we feel ourselves, we see ourselves as a small state because we are situated between two very big states, uh, China and India. Therefore, uh, if we compare with China and India, we certainly are far smaller than they. Therefore, we, we have a psychological categorization of a small state. But anyway, so we uh, say yes, we are developing countries, uh, still even today, Bangladesh, Nepal, we are LDCs, and we may categorize ourselves uh, as a small states. And your lecture, especially Professor Jaman, I very much liked um, your three types of categorization of power. Uh, you, you mentioned about this intrinsic power, every country has to uh, promote, strengthen the intrinsic power. Second, this derivative power, and I being a diplomat, I, I now feel that yes, uh, this is derivative power, and you gave the example of Israel. I think Israel is the best example of how a country can 
promote distinct from the uh, use its derivative power and get benefit from other states. And certainly the third one, the collective power. Yes, we small state, developing states. We have been working with um, uh, like-minded and like situational countries in global forums. But this collective power, there are many, many in climate change conference in go around uh, negotiations. The, the, the collective power has already been amply demonstrated. Therefore, this uh, lecture was really very useful, very much uh, uh, very relevant for all the faculty members and students as well, especially for the master's students and PhD students also. I know there are a few students who are writing thesis on small states and it would be very useful. And I saw a few of them <coughs> asking you questions. Therefore, it was very useful for faculty members, very useful for students also. And then another thing I like, Mr. it is not only theory. You, you in the beginning, you just mentioned that theory is not a silver bullet. It cannot answer all questions, but it can give us some guidance how we can solve a problem that is a function of a theory. But you just related, you just linked how theory can be and must be, in fact, applied into practice. If we don't apply theory into practice, then that, that, that theory is of no use. And then you just get, it gave the example of many countries, how small states like Singapore, Luxembourg, Estonia, uh, they have been using their strength, so-called derivative or collective strength, and some intrinsic also, how they have been using their strength for the benefit of those countries. And again, in, uh, I am a diplomat. I have very good friends from Bangladesh. Well, I was in Bangkok. Uh, I had very good friend, your ambassador in Bangladesh, uh, Saeeda Muna Tasmeem. She was a wonderful ambassador. And now I think she is in London. Uh, then uh, she, she was succeeded by another one. And both of them were very good friends of mine. There are other friends also, uh, but um, uh, not many in academia. M my point is that we, Bangladesh is not new country for us. As Professor Khadagai, she mentioned Bangladesh is our brother. We are brothers. Uh, but at the same time, we are in a way co-workers. We work together with Bangladesh in international forum. We have been just exchanging cooperation. Last year, uh, His Excellency, the President of Bangladesh, visited Nepal, missed exchange the visits, exchange the cooperation. We are very happy uh, with our uh, engagement with Bangladesh. And I, for me, Bangladesh is not a new country, but I have just seen some of the comments here that they, they, they now better understand Bangladesh. You're all detailed information about Bangladesh as a small country or whatever it is, how Bangladesh has been uh, conducting its foreign relations, how it is just applying its relations with India and China, how you are trying to balance relationship with both countries. They were also very useful and uh, your uh, lecture also helped us all uh, both the faculty and the students to understand Bangladesh better. Uh, I will not take longer time. Certainly, uh, you spent uh, about three hours, more than three hours now. And on behalf of myself, on behalf of uh, the Trivuvan University Department of Interrelations and the Diplomacy, I uh, very sincerely uh, thank you for your very hard work, for your very uh, good preparations and a very well prepared, this um, eloquent, eloquent presentation. I just think so. I long ago I read one book, uh, White Mughals by William Dalrymple. Even during my classes, I referred this book to my students and just read it how it is. And then just you 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 use the term uh, brown sahibs. There is not much difference whether they may be white Mughals or brown sahibs. Uh, national. Uh, situations are there, uh, attributes are there, and how they are compelled. And then it was really a very, very useful lecture, very good experience for us all. Uh, again, uh, as I said, to repeat again, I thank on behalf of the department, on behalf of the university, and on behalf of myself, I sincerely thank you and the other, all the participants from Nepal, from maybe hopefully Bangladesh, or I don't know from. Uh, other countries, but if there are other groups, every participants, I thank you uh, for the active participation for uh, uh, from the students also, and it was really useful um, experience, useful lecture. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank, thank, you, sir. thank you very much, sir. Uh, Professor Rashid, uh, can you could you please share one minute uh, about your experience? And we are really much overwhelmingly uh, grateful to you, uh, and what we could learn from you this morning was really remarkable. Uh, of we will be in touch. I will work together in the days to come. To of course, uh, uh, Professor Rashid helped me last year when our university was uh, looking for chief guest for uh, convocation ceremony. He facilitated to invite 
uh, vice chancellor of Dhaka University in Kathmandu. So he was he was uh, really like you know catalyst to to facilitate uh, to invite uh, chief guest uh, from Dhaka because we were not positioned to invite any Indian uh, after Kalapani case was broke out and we never like they like to confront with Pakistani of course and for Chinese and Singaporean it took a while so uh, Professor Rashid facilitated it and Dhaka University uh, Vice Chancellor came in Kathmandu as a chief guest. Once again, thank you very much. And Rashid, uh, will you please share one minute and we'll wrap up. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Kadga. Um, uh, and uh, thank you, uh, Ambassador uh, Dr. D, uh, K. N. Adhikari um, for su such an excellent um, summing up and of course the words of praise which you had for my lecture. But uh, yes, um, it has been a great pleasure and an honor indeed uh, for me uh, to speak to the students and to the faculty members of uh, Tripuvan University and particularly the student and faculty members of uh, the Department of International Relations and Diplomacy uh, based at Tripuvan University. Um, uh, Dr. Khadga, as I, as I said, I mean, at the very beginning of my lecture that we go a long back, way back together, but over the last few years, uh, particularly since 2019, we have been working closely. And of course, we look forward to strengthening uh, the bonds of cooperation between uh, Dhaka University, uh, Tripuvan University, and also between Nepal and Bangladesh um, uh, in the days ahead. Uh, saying that, a, a few things. Um, um, I believe that, yes, Bangladesh, uh, uh, over the last 40, 45 years, we have been able to um, uh, gradually develop ourselves. We still have a long, long way to go, uh, but we have been able to develop ourselves. Uh, and one thing which is very important, and I think this came out in, in today's lecture, is that we are now moving towards a world which is going to be a world where power uh, is also going to be measured in terms of knowledge. So it is going to be a knowledge-based hierarchy in the days ahead. And that is why it is extremely important that countries in South Asia, size is, is important, but it is going to be your intellectual ability, which is going to have a profound role in, in the politics, international politics of the days to come. And particularly, I would like to mention uh, India in this case. Um, one of the reasons why Indians are uh, so powerful in, in today's world is because of their intellectual ability. Uh, whether they, they speak, they write good English, they're able to make their presence felt in different forums of the world, in the global media. And as a result, the Indian view of the world gradually is has been accepted. So this is something, and of course, again, if you look at a country like uh, South Korea, for example, Singapore, for example, these are countries, even the Arab world, interestingly, these countries are also gradually trying to develop their uh, knowledge base because they understand that this is going to be the currency of the future. So uh, I would request the students here, uh, particularly uh, Professor Khadke has mentioned this, Dr. K. Nodhikari has also mentioned this, that uh, uh, you may not be the policy makers right now, but today's students are tomorrow's civil servants, tomorrow's diplomats, and maybe also tomorrow's political leaders. So it is imperative that we study, we equip ourselves for the 21st century because the 21st century is going to be the century of knowledge-based um, uh, uh, politics. And that is why I particularly feel that today's, whatever little co contribution I made today, um, and of course, if in the days ahead, if uh, my friends in Nepal, they call me, I'll always be willing to, to uh, help them in whatever way I can. Um, but it is imperative that we take advantage of these opportunities and we equip ourselves for the challenge of the 21st century. And I would again like to thank the department for inviting me and uh, both the faculty members and the students, uh, the audience in particular, for listening to me, for, as Dr. K. Nodhikari pointed out, for nearly two and a half hours. Uh, but it has been a great experience for me. It has been the two hours Two and a half hours simply passed by, and um, uh, I'm I, I, I'm extremely grateful to Professor Khatka and to Tripuvan University for having me on board, and I look forward to working with you in the days ahead. So thank you very much. Thank you, Professor. Uh, let's uh, give him a big hand because we are away in digital. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. We'll be in touch, and we'll work together. So your contribution is uh, is highly highly uh, appreciated. So thank you so much, uh, uh, Kalana sir, Himalaya sir, 
my faculty uh, member friend and students from both PhD batch and students from uh, Central Department of Rural Development. So thank you very much and have a great weekend. Professor Rashid, I, I, I make, made you to wake up early in, in weekend. No, so please okay. have a great, a great Saturday. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank yes, you. Thank I'll you. write you thank back you. later soon. Okay. I'll, I'll call you later. Okay. Thank you okay, very much. Sure. Bye.